Here's a place where all of us can be safe. Our stories of transformation can be safe, and all the things we want to research are safe here. This is Safe Space with Cheyenne. I'm really excited you're here, and I hope you stick around for a while, because I've got a lot to show you before I leave Earth. I love you guys. All right, my friends. How we doing out there? Good? Driving your cars? Loving life? Killing the new year, I assume, if you've already given up on your New Year's resolutions. That's okay, too. Because uh, according to, I don't know, anything in energy, you're actually not supposed to really start till around like, I hear like spring and all of that, you know, like when the flowers stop popping up, like that's when you get to transition. But I know we have this whole movement about like New Year's resolutions. So if you're still doing it and kicking an ass, good for you. If you're not, fuck it, who cares? Tomorrow's another day, right? But today I have such... Like, how do I even explain it? We've been talking for an hour and a half off air before we actually decided to press record. And, I mean, the shit that we're supposed to talk about today is everything that I love talking about. There's so many parallels in our lives. I'm so excited to introduce you to Nicole from Holistic Vitality. She has just recently adopted her soul name, Akora. Did I pronounce that right? Wonderful. Yeah, that's correct embodying that soul that soul name that soul work and really bringing it to the present moment so we have a lot of stuff to talk to you guys about today plant medicine journeys trials tribulations you know the usual off-brand improv friends having a cup of coffee conversation so we're going to dig deep a little bit for you to inspire you to do it and um if you're really interested about any form of plant medicine, we're definitely going to get a lot of education in there for not only me, because I learn from everybody that I get to bring on the show, but um, you'll also be able to contact her after this. And if you feel like doing a plant medicine ceremony, let's get your ass to Colorado. Am I right? Nicole, welcome for coming on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm glad to be able to talk to you guys today and see where this conversation leads. I'm really excited, and I mean, like, we've definitely had just a really good warm-up, so I mean, even if we repeat any of the stories that we just said, like, who cares? We got to make sure people hear it, but um, I'm so curious of, like, where we're actually supposed to start in your journey, so I'm just going to kind of let you decide where you want to introduce your story out in the beginning um, of, like, how you've gotten into the embodiment of a Cora. And that's where I figured it would be a good place to start, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So I definitely want you to take it away. And if I have any questions, I'll be happy to interject. Sweet. Um, So on New Year's Eve was when I made the official decision to really um, make the switch and transition to what has been revealed to me as my soul's name, which is Akura. And this has been happening for the last few years because a lot of my um, facilitation of shamanic journeys, uh, a lot of my clients end up channeling, which means a lot of times, you know, uh, higher sentient beings are communicating either to them or through them. And then I'm fucking communicating with like ascended masters and guides and things like that. And so over the last several years, it keeps being brought up and Nicole's not your name right so and then they'll be like your soul's name is Akura and it kept happening to the point where I'm like okay okay there's obviously some consistency and uh, validation that clearly you know my soul's name is this you know and um, I've always had an issue with identity in my lifetime I think too so um, maybe that's why is because I was just wrongly identified with my birth name you know and now I'm coming into like who is the me that I'm going into and what is the best representation of that and the call I feel like I'm now outgrowing with this old version that I'm just like I feel like ready to relinquish so I decided on New Year's Eve <clears throat> that I'm just going to take it on and I've been having some conversations with others that have similarly taken on their chosen name or their soul's name and how they went about that and why so and finally I was just like you know what I think I'm ready. And so now I'm just in that process of transition and letting the world know that, like, here I am. (laughs) I'm embodying my true self. I really think it's cool that you brought up, um, like, not necessarily, like, the discomfort in your human name, but realizing that there's something to investigate there. 
you mm -hmm. know, because like I'm sure there's like plenty of other lifetimes where people are like, oh, I don't really like my name. I don't really like this. But I think those discomforts are there for you to like dig into them and find, you know, like why you don't feel like Nicole really fits for you. Because like Nicole identifies like your human self, right? Like mm -hmm. who, who you came into experience the physical realm with. But the fact that you're able to evolve so much on your journey and then embody that oh. soulful name and be like, I'm, I'm bringing this in to the physical as well. I'm not denying Nicole by any means. Like I'm still a mother. I still have this work to do. I still have a human experience to do, but moving forward, like this is what in I'm going to, to yeah, this is what I'm going identity. to present to the world. Exactly. Now I think it's great. The first time I heard, uh, my, friend Esther tell me about that when she was explaining a lot of things about spiritual awakenings to me at the time she was like yeah there's people that you know basically like relinquish their human identity that was gifted to them by their parents at the time and they take mm -hmm. on they take on the name of like what they believe their spirit is and I was just like definitely something to dig in down the road like make a note of it for sure and then over time like um, I was telling you earlier like mine's moonbeam um, right. and I felt like I really embodied that just from like a younger age, like, you know, especially if you're an empath or you're a severe empath, like you've always been like the Oprah, the Dr. Phil of the group, or like people are always calling you to like cry on your shoulder, rescue them, or just like have that very insightful conversation with them. And they, I feel like there's a lot of dark things that people would bring to me because like, I wouldn't condemn them for their actions. I wouldn't judge them. I would just like be there to listen, which you know, you, you start learning the terminology more and you really get into what it actually means to hold space, but also the definition of holding space. So I realized for the longest time, um, I had just naturally been able to hold space for a lot of the darkness in people that they were obviously scared to admit out in the real world. Like, I struggle with this. I actually am this way. Oh, shit, I was the villain in this situation. Like, how do I rectify the situation? How do I seek forgiveness, do all this stuff? So the moonbeam for me was like, there's a lot of people that don't know how to hold space and they would go to all these other people and they, as soon as they hit a dark point, they're like, oh yeah, that's a little too dark for me. I don't really know what to do that. And then they would come to me and they'd be like, okay, I'm a little vulnerable right now. I don't really know how to say this. So I'm just going to say this. And then I'm like, oh no, completely understandable. Like, yeah, let's just pull this apart. And it, it's not like emotionally draining for me to be there. Like I feel... It's kind of like um, footprints in the sand, right? It's just like when you saw only one set of footprints, that's when I carried you. Not that I'm like saying I'm Jesus or anything, but we were raised on that poem from like day one. So it was like when you're in your darkest moments of hopelessness and all of this, it's like, yes, you can go to God, you can go to divine, you can go to spirit, but in your human connection, it's still nice to know that you have someone there to hold space for like even that like demon side of you is what you yeah. could say it is. So um, yeah, I mean, embodying that is super well. powerful. You. Do what? I said I can totally relate to what you said there with how my path has unfolded and how um, people gravitate towards the container that I hold for that very sake as well, is that there's no judgment. And I've had to hear over the course of like being on my path the last eight years in service, um, I've had to hear like the worst of the worst stories that if people have had to um, show up vulnerable in. And that's kind of a container that I hold as well is the transparency and authenticity in how I myself choose to want to show up in so that there is that container that others know that they're encouraged and, and that's ex exactly what I expect them to be able to do is to be authentic, to share their darkest spaces, to be able to also then do something about it. So not just to talk about it, to share about it. It's like, what can we do to actually uh, address that, to heal that, to integrate that? And, and that's been a big part of my path. But the ability and the willingness, I think, is important for people to feel safe and seen and heard and non-judged to be able to even therefore share some of those things that they've maybe carried their own self-judgment or criticisms, criticisms or shame or guilt or whatever that may be, whatever their story is, um, whether it was how maybe they were wronged or things that were done to them that, you know, nobody should go through or versus things that they 
may have been in a position of where they've done to others that, you know, wasn't their best self and maybe there was reasons behind that too. And, and so I don't carry any judgment um, more. So it's like, how do we relinquish what's not serving you heal that, which is unresolved so that you can move forward and become that best higher version whom you are in your truth and your essence before you, you know, basically got molded by society that created a lot of falsehood as to who our and what our truth is, you know, and, and where that programming and life experience and how you interacted with it and things that got pushed on you that may have distorted your own sense of self and how you navigated your reality until maybe you decided to answer your own soul's calling to go on the path and do your fucking spiritual work and show up for yourself to heal, to, to move forward, you know, in whatever that specific path is to each one their own, right? I also think it's, like, supporting and not necessarily, like, you going in and, like, cutting the cords for them and releasing the attachments. It's just, like, I'm going to show you what you are subconsciously attaching yourself to based on indoctrination, conditioning, societal values, past life karma, karma contracts, soul con Like, there's so many different, like, mm -hmm. films that mm -hmm. we can lay over each other. But it's, like, I'm going to show you that this is actually operating in the background. It's like an iPhone. You're like, my battery's draining. I don't get it. And then you like hit your button and you're like, I have 20 fucking apps open in the background. What's going on? Same <laughs> exact thing that I've found in all of these things, whether like I'm the facilitator, or I'm the person that like gets to have space held for them. Um, is, is it's just like realizing these attachments that you don't know you have because you've been trained that these attachments are the fucking purpose of your existence. And then, like, mm -hmm. the labeling comes into play, which my friend said that she did a label burning, burning ceremony with one of my other high-vibe friends the other day. And she was, like, j just, like, talking about it. Like, you take a piece of paper and you write down every label that's ever been given to you, whether it's derogatory, whether mm -hmm. it's sister, mother, brother, cousin. Like, all of these attachments and all of these labels that really mm -hmm. cover you up she's like so we're gonna write all them down on a piece of paper we're gonna send them love because we're very appreciative of them being here right we're not burning them like a banishment but we're like we're going to release these attachments through this physical ritual and i was like how fucking powerful i said my fucking ass does simmer pots and writes on bay leaves but i never thought of doing like a label releasing ceremony of releasing myself from these attachments that not necessarily I drew the cord to, but people put the cord on me and was like, oh, you're this, you're this, you know? And as a mother, I know you can identify that because I'm sure there's plenty of people out there in the world <laughs> doing their judging and condemning or ugh, all that shit that we don't like to get into. And they're just like, oh, you're a mother. And you're like, yes, that is part of my identity. I am, I'm very happy to be a mother. I love my children. I love supporting my children and like being the earth guide is what I think. But I also, like I have other things outside of that. Like I have my mm. own ident identity as Nicole. I have my own identity as my soul's name and what my purpose is. But it's so easy to like, even like, I don't know, like getting caught up with like even older generations that like their footprint isn't really necessarily to like come and like wake up. Theirs was to like build the foundation of the physical world and like live whatever pathway they're supposed to live. And it's just like, oh yeah, that's really, so are you working out of the home now? Oh, are you? And like you, you sometimes have those like disapproving like grandmas and aunts that are like, well, you know a mother's job you know, like, you better make sure you do your mother's job first because, like, well, that, that's... Clock or get paid for. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, it's the hardest fucking job in the world, but, yeah, like, you don't get a 1099 for being a badass mom, right? Um, yeah. But, like, since, that, since that's the program that way went, like, that's how they receive their self-worth, their identity, and their validation in the world. It's just, like, how can you go against the natural order of the woman's role? You're supposed to be the mother and the caretaker and blah, 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 the blah, 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 and the wife and the everything. And then yeah. you're just supposed to be expected. And mm -hmm. guess what? You come last. Yes. Yes. Like, but, then we, put our, but then we put ourselves yourself. last. Then yeah, we put ourselves yourself. last and then wonder why we're last. Yeah. Well, then in just like celebrating, celebrating the strength that comes with all of that trauma is something that I just found extremely annoying. 
like especially going through like pregnancy. I remember I was taking notes of everything I experienced when I found out I was pregnant, during my pregnancy, during having the baby and right after. Because I was like, why don't you guys talk about this? Because you're like, oh, having a child is wonderful. Like, I don't even remember how painful it was to have my baby. I fucking do. And when I meet a a pregnant woman, I'm like, hey, don't let them lie to you and fucking sugarcoat this experience. I was like, one, your body and your vessel is the bridge between the spiritual world and the physical world. So you take that fucking power and you enjoy like having this experience because it's an absolute honor to be a woman alone, whether you have a baby or not. But then when you have a baby, like you're bridging that gap. But then don't let them fucking gaslight you and believing that you're not going to go through all these horrible experiences and they don't want to admit that they pooped while they had a baby. So they're not going to warn your ass because guess what? Like 85 to 90 percent of women poop when they have babies. It's okay. I knew that going in, so I warned everybody. I was like, (laughs) just so you know, I know I'm going to poop and you guys are going to try to hide it from me. I also ate blue licorice yesterday, so it'll probably look like a fucking Smurf. So (laughs) let's get this baby out of us, you know? (laughs) But I guess like just warning people about the shit that people don't want to talk about, I definitely have identified that as part of my purpose. It's like, yeah, and I think moms do it to each other. Moms do it to each other because we're like, you want to be this perfect mom and you're afraid mm-hmm. to even admit when you, you know, when you're like, oh my God, I almost burnt this house down one night when I was sanitizing the bottles and they just so happened to be plastic. And I took a break from that while I was just slowly boiling and I thought how oh, I needed to take a nap and the baby, you know, you're cuddled and you're like, I'm just so tired. And you wake up and then you're like, oh, I'm so, I must've been really tired. It's so groggy in here. Like, what the heck? And then you realize it's not your eyes. It's the fucking room. And you're like, oh my God, I just almost burned our house down and killed no us both inside shit. of it because I'm so fatigued mm-hmm. that I couldn't even stay awake. And that's how delirious I was. Yeah. True story. But then like on that level, like moms don't talk about it. And you're like, oh, I'm just this great mom and I have to be this perfect mom. Yeah. And I just, I'm supposed to love being a mom because it's the most Im- important, amazing role in the world. And then you're like, but I don't always feel that way. And is there something wrong with that? And I think it's because there's these expectations of living this double life. Those, mm-hmm. the ones that other people project onto you, aren't you just so excited? And you're like, well, actually, no, I'm fucking thinking I'm having like a nervous breakdown because I haven't had sleep and I'm this walking cafeteria and I have no help because, you know, my partner is too busy playing provider to fulfill his ego's need to fulfill this family role of us being at home and the trophy wife with the kid when meanwhile mm-hmm. you're like, I have a life I want to live too mm-hmm. outside of this. But yet, these are all my shoulds and expectations, and I'm just supposed to love it. My God, my my mother-in-law. I remember we were doing we were doing like a big estate sale clear out for the house to get ready for the baby. Like you know, just purging all because I was still definitely doing my spiritual work, but I had I had like definitely like my channel closed off so I could be a human to have a human is what was told to me. And we were yeah. sitting out on the porch doing the yard sale, and I was so sick during my first trimester. Like, I'm really glad that I didn't have a 9 to 5 to go to because they just fired my fucking ass because I'd have puked all over the fucking business, right? So I'm sitting out on the porch, and she's so excited that, like, I'm obviously going to have her grandchild. And she's like, oh, my God, I love my pregnancy, and aren't you so excited to be pregnant? And just, like, June cleavering the whole conversation. And I just looked at her, I was like, I am not fucking excited to be pregnant right now. I'm like, I do want to have my baby. I'm really excited to meet my baby girl, but I am so fucking sick right now. My body is like my enemy right now. I'm like, I'm sitting on a porch. It's 98 degrees. I'm trying to be nice to people so they'll buy my fucking shit. I was like, like, I was literally just like, fuck off with this pregnancy is a fucking gift bullshit right now because I'm fucking sick. I feel like I drank a bottle of tequila, snorted an eight ball and woke up the next day and was like, oh, why am I so sick? Which I've never really snorted a whole eight ball. Like that takes (laughs) some fucking concentration. (laughs) How about about like the thing that I found during pregnancy, and I know we're detouring our conversation, but um, was like the part I didn't like is how everybody else thought they had a fucking say on what you were doing with your body. It's like when did my body become your body? Mm-hmm. Because I have, I'm having a baby now, all of a yeah. sudden, like 
Or the C section now, now, now I need to like eat what you think I should eat, not eat what you think I should eat, mm -hmm. don't participate in this activity. You know, and it's like all of a sudden it was like everybody else had a fucking say. I'm like, when did my body all of a sudden become assumed by you? Like, yeah, leave me the fuck alone. Impressed. If I want to eat this, I'm going to fucking eat this. If I'm going to have these cravings, which God forbid this baby is having and making me have these weird, insane cravings, leave me the fuck alone. Yep. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to eat like, with the my fucking body's, My body is literally not mine right now. Like, it's totally fine. Like, Mexican food and Italian food are my two favorite foods to, like, go and OD on and go into a food coma and, like, wait, do too much Netflix. And I lost both of those in my first trimester. Like, I was really struggling with what to eat in the beginning. And then when I was like, I can't have Italian food, I was like, fuck. And then they, they took the Mexican food away. I was like, fuck. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, this is terrible. Like, I am not in control of my vessel. And then, yeah, everybody just, like, giving unsolicited advice, right? Because that's just what you do, like, when you see someone pregnant. You're just like, oh, are you going to do natural and C-section? Are you going to stay at home? Are you going to do this? And then I'll be like, well, I'm going to try natural if it works. Well, are you going to get an epidural? And it's like, fuck, yeah, I'm getting an epidural. And they're like, oh, well, I had three kids, and I pushed them all out natural, and I didn't have one bit of medicine. And I was like, go fucking you. Not me. Not me. Thank you, modern medicine. You better shoot I mean, my yeah. ass up. But even, but even then, like, you have the pregnancy plan, and how does that ever go according to plan? Who can, how can you really plan for that? There's no plan. No, I had to ask there's for a C-section. There's, preferen there's preferences. Yeah. There's no plan for an emergency C-section, you know? There's no plan that you're going to be no. sitting through labor unless you get induced and you have to sit there for five hours or go home and come back during a snowstorm. <laughs> you're like, yeah, story. unless you want to induce yeah. eight days past two, you know, you're like, yes. you're like <laughs> anyways, oh that's God. a good cool story too. Yeah, no. And I mean, we can definitely plan for that, that stuff, but plan it, really, to it really is fun to just talk about like the societal struggles of like what a woman again is expected to do and expected to be as a wife, as a mother, and just as a person like fitting into society. And again, like when they start paying us to do that, then maybe they can have a say in it. Well, I actually had that conversation with my husband one time because we, like, there was, I was working, I went back to work at, like, 27 or 30 weeks or something, and I was traveling between here and Oklahoma, living in a hotel, coming home, living in a hotel, going home. I would be getting up at 4.30 in the morning and driving three and a half hours away. I would be so sick and fatigued while I was driving that I had to pull over to gas station for, like, months, mm -hmm. and I would have to take a nap in the gas station parking lot. Because I could not drive anymore. And then I'd wake up and I'd be like, okay. Then I would go to work and work a 10-hour shift training for a new job in multiple stations, multiple different curriculums, and then just dealing with, like, fucking people all around me. So mm. that was super fun. And then, like, go through the pregnancy, all of that. Ultimately, I quit my job because my mothering was suffering. And I was like, I don't care what I have to do, I'm not giving up this time with my daughter because I actually believe that I have to go out of the house and work and give up this time with my daughter. So luckily he works such a good enough job that we were able to work that out at the time. Like this was way before the podcast stuff ever started. I was still mm -hmm. coming into my purpose, right? And mm -hmm. we were going over bills and um, like definitely in his job, like his self-worth is 100% based on productivity in the capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I'm staying home barely wanting to fucking shower because like what's the fucking point I haven't left the house in weeks and like you I'm like I'm a cafeteria for my kid and you know housework and all this stuff and I finally looked at him one day and I was like how much does a baby cost like if we put it down on paper like what is if we're gonna trade money for money like you're giving me money a place to live food to eat and you're providing for me I said and your fucking kids alive every goddamn day you come home and I actually am alive too the dogs are alive the house is clean I was like let's put a monetary value on what the fuck I'm doing at the house because I don't mind being a domesticated wife but I don't like being someone that feels like they have no value because I don't have any money in my bank account anymore I used to make my own money I used to have my 401k I used to have all my stock options and I've given it up two times, three times before. And 
tapping yeah, into the mom. mother. Yeah, and then I became a mom. And you don't make fucking money being a mom, okay? I know you can have a side business. But it's a job that you never get to clock out of. And you never, just expect it. Never, ever, ever. And then obviously, like, I'm like, oh, God, when your dad gets home, I'm going to get a break. But I still have to, like, we used to have the same job. I know how you have to decompress after his work. So I was like, please take this baby from me. Like, please <laughs> let me let me go die in this corner for an hour and just have my alone time. And even like the whole breastfeeding journey, like I remember sitting in my rocking chair in a dark room and if she wasn't on me, the breast pump was on me and it was so dark. And I just, I felt like I was in like a NyQuil days where I was like, am I ever going to get out of here? Well, I just wake up every day like it's Groundhog's Day and all I'll do is be in this dark room feeding Cleaning this up guy. Like, diapers. Yeah, like, oh my God, Working this diaper and smells and so bad. Crying. Well, not just changing the diaper, but like analyzing, like, is the poop okay? Is it green? Is it yellow? Did we get the tar off her butt? Is she, you know, like, did you really up, do. Did they, up, did they blow out the, the diaper yeah. off their back? Like, all like, the fun things about motherhood that we're trying to, like, oh, you're going to miss that stuff when it's gone. No, I won't. And then, and then the guy, like, comes home and ready for his, you know what, at the door because you should be so grateful that he provides for you. And you're like, you want to hear about my day? Yeah. Yeah. We woke up like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm so put together and look so beautiful. And I've just been, you know, this cow whale that I'm trying to, those things like eating my fat off of me. Oh, yeah. And I haven't even eaten myself. Because, you know, their their needs are more important that I don't even have needs. Well, you're not even I don't even have my own needs anymore. You've, you've lost your appetite from working so hard. And, like, okay, I'm so like, let's talk bear. about, let's <laughs> lock, before we wrap the mom stuff up, because I think this is very introspective, but I'm sure people are like, let's talk about Bufo in a minute. Um, but the way <sighs> that you obviously lose your body in a pregnancy, whether you want to admit it or not, you really are going after what the kid needs. That's the sacrificial role of the mother, super honorable not going to shove it down in any way, shape, or form. But the fact that you have to relearn your body and get acquainted with your new body after having a baby, whether you're losing the baby weight, whether your hips turned inward so the kid can, like, sit on it when it's a toddler, super fucking awesome. Dealing with trying to figure out how to love your new body, especially if you already didn't love your body after before pregnancy. After your boobs, like... So, yeah, like breastfeeding, <laughs> mastitis, like the big fucking nipples. Because I know it's like, from like a man's perspective, it's like, all my guy friends were like, oh my God, like breastfeeding boobs are like the best. They're so full and so luscious and so this. And I'm like, try waking up at 3 a.m. with a kid on your nipple. You know, like, try, Wait till try having done. like hard cracked bloody nipples because something's always fucking sucking on it i'm like not it's not a porn star look like why am i in sweatpants and my husband's sweatshirt because i don't want to fucking look at my body right now do i love myself absolutely i love myself but i don't recognize myself and i'm going to admit that to myself because there's no reason to be like oh i'm so fucking happy that i gained like 200 50, fucking 50, pounds 50 during pounds. my pregnancy. And now, like, I can't work out because I was cut seven layers deep and fucking survived. Try that, men. Seven layers deep. Only thing on the earth get, that can survive being cut that deep and survive are women. Woo! Fun fact of the day. Yeah, so then you continue to, like, lose the pregnancy weight, but still, like, your bone, your bones are different. Your hips are different. The way your jeans are different. Your, your skin, your hair, all of this fucking your shit. Mind. Your moves, your moves. Oh my god. Oh. The fucking hormone, like hormonal acne. Sorry, fuck sunny you. fucking sunshine over here. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, oh, well, you better be in a good mood. You, you better still have sex with your husband or he's going to leave you. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't want to be a baby until he gets that shit nip tucked. You yeah, know what I mean? Shit. Oh my god. <laughs> that was the thing to And he just gets to go about his life like he ne like nothing fucking changed. He goes to work goes to see his friend, goes snowboarding, whatever, you know, and you're like, everything about my life and my body changed, my mood, and like, and I'm just supposed to be grateful well, and happy. And your attachment with your child, too, because I remember one time, my husband was 100% supportive, like, we've definitely had some issues where I'm like, you don't understand the privilege in being a man, like, I grew this baby inside of me, you have no idea, and then I'd be like, I really need to just take a nap by myself, I'm just gonna go in the room and everything's fine. Uh, I lit like my body was exhausted, but my mind was like, where's the baby? Where's the baby? Where's the baby? I can't let you go to sleep because the baby's not near you. So I literally walked out into the living room, grabbed her, 
and just laid her next to me in bed. And she was sleeping, which was fine, but I wanted to literally, like, knock out for, like, three hours, just fucking go away somewhere. And I, my body nor my mind would literally let me be away from her. She had to be right next to me in order for me to do any type of rest, anything. Like, I always had to have my eyes on her. And like, I was, I was consciously aware of it. I was like, okay, is this a weird fucking attachment? Like, let's dig into this. But I was like, my body won't let me be away from my baby right now. So if I really want to get some rest, I'm just going to have to be with her all the time. And we were together all the fucking time. I had my baby February, 2020, right before the world shut down. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like I felt very fortunate because I, I was so glad that I got to be with her, but the whole fucking world shut down and we are living in a city where the news is telling you, well, nobody's working now. Supplies are running out. So your house could get looted. So my husband sent me back home to my family farm to live with my family who has guns and, you know, has Mm. freezer stocked full of food because he's working all day. And I have a gun and a knife and a taser on the fireplace, but I'm also, I have a newborn and a pit bull and a beagle. He's like, I don't want, I don't want you in the city. He's like, I just feel like the city's really unsafe. He's like, you're going to have to go home. So I went and stayed with my mom for almost a month during COVID, which is a lifesaver because my mom was so great at teaching me how to be with a newborn and like keeping up everything, but still fucking exhausting. You're already vulnerable as a woman. You're vulnerable having a child. You're vulnerable after your pregnancy because again, I was still healing. from. And you're living back with your own mom. And I'm living back with my own mom, which I mean, you know, we're compatible and then we're not right. Like we go back and forth. And then obviously like the whole world is under a state of survival and just a fear frequency and what the fuck is going on, what is happening. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. just out here living back in my hometown like I never wanted to during one of the most crazy fucking times of my life. I would call my fucking husband. I fucking lost it one time because (laughs) he went and visited one of our friends in Oklahoma and they went to the casino and I had been, you know, doing the mom life. And I was like, you went to the casino in the middle of a pandemic and I was like, you don't want me to come home. You don't want to see your baby anymore, do you? And he's like, oh, mm-hmm. come on. He's like, it's fun. It's this, it's that. And I was like, you have no idea the privilege you have being a man. You just really don't. You really fucking <sighs> don't. I'm like, I'm getting off the phone right now because I'm going to start insulting you. And I don't really feel like apologizing to you later because I fucking mean it. Okay. So then mm-hmm. like, you know, we had our alone time and he's like, I can see where you're coming from. And I was like, Will you just come get me? My mom's had CNN on for a month straight. I don't know who this Fauci character is, but he's fucking (laughs) soul stinks. I can't take this anymore. Like, thank God I had headphones and I could, like, knock out to the world. But still, like, I had my baby and all the womanly responsibilities. And I had 100% lost my identity in that, too. I was like, I'm never going to be doing do anything that I want to do again. My life's over. I feel trapped. I love being a mother, but I'm trapped. Now this is my identity. This is what I'm doing. She's three years old now. She's a fucking rock star, and I completely have my whole identity and my life back. But I fought for that fucking shit, and I fought mm. hard. And I, I think every I woman needs to me. hear this message because, I, you know, like, like my, like my sister, I mean, we talk about this, too, because she's going through the same thing, and, you know, she just feels like the same thing. Like, he's working all the time and just... Being a mom is fully on her shoulders. Being the parent is fully on her shoulders. Mm-hmm. And if anything goes wrong, it's her fault. If the kids didn't learn everything at the right time. Because why? He gets to now avoid all accountability because it's not his job to be the fucking parent. You help make the baby. Mm-hmm. You should help fucking raise the baby. Why did you just get to, like, be, like, you know, uh, what's the word? Immune to, like, the role of fucking parenting, you know? But but like, then But then moms need to hear here. this because it's not pleasant and then they feel guilty if they don't feel like a ray of sunshine because they didn't get they didn't necessarily choose that lifestyle and same thing like yeah her life changed and now feels like she's stuck and doesn't have a say in her own life and and the difference I think for me just kind of like what you said I luckily had my work I had my passion before the kid came involved to where I had to fight to try to keep both alive, which made my life hell, you know, because it's like, you're this full-time mom, and then you're, as soon as they have their two days off, you're like, I'm out, you got the baby, I'm out, I'm taking clients, and if I'm not taking clients, I'm fucking out anyways, because I'm going to go into my safe space, and I'm going to heal myself, and I'm just going to have quiet, even, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to fight for that, and I think, luckily, I did that, because now, 
in hindsight, after going through, you know, a divorce this year, fucking thank God I had something to fall back on that was mine that I created, that I fought hard to maintain and keep and build alongside trying to do the full-time mom thing. So it wasn't just like, here, you, you get to just explore your career and your passion and your path. No, I had to fight for that. And I'm glad I did because it's, it's what, it's my, I mean, I'm still passionate. I still love what I do. And I know what I'm doing is changing people's lives. And, um, and I get to be a part of that. But it's, but being a mother isn't all that defines me because I have other things that define me. And thank God for that. You know what I mean? Thank God I had something else that was mine that, that wasn't defined by a role I was in just because I was the female and the mother or that I was this partner or wife that all of a sudden this just was the role I was supposed to fucking be in. And I'm like, I, I rebelled I mean, that. So feel trapped. Like even if you have a good stable relationship, like all of these dark thoughts, if they don't come at you at one time, I think you're a fucking liar because there's multiple times in motherhood and being a wife no, and trying to fit yeah. in that I'm like, I'm so fucking trapped right now. Like, fucking shit, what do I do? And like you, like I love that you had the business and you're like, this is mine, this is tangible. Mine was, I had literally just found myself. I had just mm. reclaimed like, oh my God, I'm so fucking worthy of existing. I'm so fucking worthy of love. I had like dark night of the soul experiences, like expansion, gifts, clear senses, like all this stuff had come out. And I was like, oh my God, I can breathe. I found myself like, oh, the wind on my face. I can feel all that. And then like, I found out I was pregnant, which was a completely other like crazy miracle in my life that was able to manifest. And I was like, oh, I lost myself again. Like, how, why mm -hmm. would you, and you know, like there was almost like a mad part of it. I was like, why the fuck would you show me that? And then now like it's basically ripped away from me is how mm -hmm. I felt at the time. I was like, I need that breath. I need that oxygen and that knowing and that fucking love to come back to me. And I felt like, okay, well, obviously I have to nurture my body to nurture this baby. And now I don't recognize my body. And now I'm just experiencing heartburn for the first time. It's literally its name. Your, your heart burns my esophagus. I want to rip it out of my fucking throat. This is insane. So like having the human experience in it, I'm so overly grateful for it as much as I like satire the whole experience. But then when I'm like, okay, now this baby's attached to me all the time. Like, where do I fit myself back in? How do I once again learn how to reclaim myself with a little bit of insight in the manual that I had Hi. just fucking found? I was like, how is this even going to be possible? And I remember like I was going to go back out on the road and do like a bunch of vending with my company. And before the morning sickness kicked in, I was like this, the pregnancy, the motherhood's not going to hold me back no matter how hard it gets. Like fucking talking to myself in the mirror, no matter how hard it gets, like your kids can be a part of everything that you do. I think a mother having her own identity and showing her kids, like you get to be yourself and you get to be the wife and the mother and all of this. So I was like, I don't want to sacrifice myself in front of my daughter and yeah. And show her like, I know you had dreams, but I had you and I had to give them up. So now I work this job that I fucking hate because I have to provide for you. You know, and then I'm going to resent you and you're going to carry these woundings because yeah. you're going to feel this resentment for you existing all because I didn't get to fulfill my fucking mm -hmm. dreams, which what you trauma did we then adopt like from my own parents? Like you were just talking about earlier um, about, you know, like the same thing with your own mother. Like I didn't get to live out my dreams because I had had kids and it's like that's not the model we want to teach them because, you know, I think that's where society leads us all astray is that you can't do and be what you love because somehow there's some sort of like negative association that you won't be able to do that. But then if I subscribe to the belief that you're this powerful fucking creator and you create your reality, but if you don't know that, then sure you're going to buy into all this, uh, adopted limiting beliefs that you, you came from your, you know, prior caregivers and those that are in your environment of like who and what you should be be that you don't ever discover your true fucking power that you're like no that's not what i'm gonna be i can i want best of both worlds and i can have it and i'm gonna create whatever it is that i want to be and become and do and it's possible and no i'm not gonna accept that i'm gonna be this starving artist or whatever this 
mm-hmm. thing connotations there because why can't we live our dream and dream our life, you know, and therefore live our dream, mm-hmm. which I believe we can. Absolutely. But my mom did a really good job of like showing us like how to work hard and do all of that. My mom had three kids before the age of 21, like knocked them out super freaking mm-hmm. fast. Mm-hmm. And, but she was also like, she, she showed us music. I had a stepdad that was in a band. So like we went to his shows when we were a kid, like there was music and bands and live instruments and everything all around us. So that like, talk about music being your first love. Like that was like my mom's love language. And that was her way to really connect with us. She worked so hard, obviously emotionally um, unavailable a lot of the time because of being so exhausted from being the provider in every aspect. She was the provider and she was the mom. She was the provider and the mom. She worked right. four, my mom four was jobs. Like me too. Yeah. Four jobs and put herself back through college. She inspired me to never fucking give up ever. But there were so many times where I would be with her and we would like sing together all the time. And she had, she would sing like Patsy Cline and Tammy Wynette and her voice was so pretty. And from a really young age, I would, I always wondered, like, I wonder who you could have been if like you didn't have kids. Like, I wonder what dreams you did have. And it wasn't like a bad thought to have, but I always looked at her and I was like, what would you have been had you not had us? And I remember having a conversation with her and she was just like, I would never want to know. She was like, you, mm. you kids are like my everything. She's like, she's like, I, I wouldn't even want to think about it. She's like, maybe if I hadn't had you and that was the life I was supposed to live, she's like, yeah, like maybe I, I would have done this or I would have done this or I would have done this. Like, yeah, I had all these dreams. She's like, but no dream that I had was ever better than being your mother. And I was just like, Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's go change the trash, right? Let's just go suck this shit back in. Um, but she, she did a really fucking good job at showing us, like, she definitely had, like, some outdated limiting beliefs, like, you know, finding out she was pregnant when she did, like, growing up in a Catholic family, if you're, like, un, unwed, all that shit, it's just like, oh, no, you had premarital sex. It's just like, what the fuck ever, right? Like, there were obviously, like, all those things that danced around back in those times, but she always said, um, you know, I made I made my bed and I'm going to lay in it. I made my bed, I'm going to lay in it. And there were a lot mm-hmm. of things that had evolved in her relationship where I think she, she, too, came up against stuff, and she was like, I don't have to take this shit. I don't have to rely on this. I don't have to rely on this. I can do it myself. So... There were so many things from a young age that she was like, if you don't like the situation that you're in, you can get out of it, but you better work your fucking ass off for it because you're going to have to fight for yourself. And my mom fought for herself for so many fucking years in so many different situations, whether it was work, whether it was higher pay, whether it was higher education, um, a compatible partner, like all of these fucking things. I was able to watch my mom like fight through so many different ailments and still be like, of course I would love to lay in bed all day and take medicine and not do it. I remember, um, she was like so disabled at one point from the beginning marketing of fibromyalgia when they were like, Oh, it's all in your Mm -hmm. head, but here have all these prescriptions and you know, we'll figure it out down the road. She was like, I am, she's like, at one point she's like, I was so sick. I was able to take disability. Like I wouldn't have had to work I could have taken disability and stayed at home and ate ho-hos all day and never worked on myself. She goes, but I didn't want you kids to see me give up because if I gave up, then that was teaching you when life gets rough, you just give the fuck up. And she's like, baby, she's like, the mountain can't get any bigger. You can. So, so it's interesting too. Like, so kind of like segueing into like this mother theme, um, I would say, you know, and obviously the things that we were intending to talk upon with like, you know, the journey and plant medicines and, and all this other stuff, I would say for me, um, what led, so beginning of 2016 was actually my first ayahuasca experience, which the intentions of that was to clear up all the mommy trauma stuff, right? And, um, or where there was mixed wires and misunderstandings and where, you know, that relationship just wasn't its healthiest. But for me, even leading into right before that, I uh, I was trying to meditate on like what my spirit animal guide was, and I wasn't getting very far with it. And I think probably at the time, maybe my ego was getting a little bit in the way. And uh, at the time too, I think my sister had a friend that kind of passed away, 
in what she felt was some like um, foul business. You know what I mean? Like the, the building burnt down and now all of a sudden it was kind of like, is this a murder mystery? And so one of the things that we got introduced to and um, that I feel like initiated a lot of my path was at the age of 13, I was introduced to a modality called the glass, which is a kind of like a spirit communication board, but a homemade version of it to communicate with the spirit realm. So I was introduced to that by my grandmother and my mother when I was 13. And we were talking to my, like my great grandmother through this means of communicating to the spirit realm. Right. So it was a tool that I kind of had in my life that showed me this profound connection to these unforeseen realms well anyways after meditating and all that now we're trying to talk trying to call in her friend to be like was there foul play in your death or whatever but instead of him coming through right away it was my spirit animal guide which guess what is the toad tori the toad which is funny because i then eventually got led to bufo the toad medicine so it kind of synchronistic but anyways uh, and at first my ego was kind of like disappointed. I'm like, really? The fucking toad, you know, like, yeah. really? You couldn't have come up with anything better. <laughs> like, yeah, for sure. You're like, don't I, although don't, now I want to be like, a fucking lion, right? I want to be, I want to, rawr. Whatever, hawk, I don't know, you know, yeah. wolf. You know, you really like have this like idea of what's this hierarchy. Although now I have mad respect for the toad because it can coexist in two different realms, you know, because they also like live underground or in water, but on land. So they have the ability to coexist between worlds. And so I have a much appreciation now for the, the toad and its, and its actual medicine, which we'll talk about shortly. But anyways, at this particular time leading up to my first ayahuasca journey, this guy, spirit animal guide comes through and they give me this message that, a baby is on its way. And my sister's like, oh my God, you're going to be a mother. And I'm like, yeah, 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 not for like another year. I'm not ready. I'm still trying to work through my my mom trauma stuff, which she would know about because we were, we were sisters, you know. She shared in that environment, you know, whatever that upbringing was like. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, sure enough, then I had my first ayahuasca experience. Mind blown. My fucking world's changing. I felt so much love, understanding my mom stuff some of it anyways, and then had to learn some lessons after the fact, which is, I did a video about, but anyways, besides the point, tapped into this amazing fucking place, just like you, you know, you're like, oh my God, I just got cracked wide open, and then three weeks later, find up I'm fucking pregnant, and I'm like, well, damn, at least I got a heads up, I guess, because my spirit animal guide at least gave me the you know, a forewarning, like, by the way, you're going to be a mom soon. I just thought I would be able to control it a little bit more and postpone it until I decided I was fucking ready. But apparently, you know, my daughter decided she was ready and was like, no, no, now's the time. time. But it was funny because it got channeled through that that was going to be the case. But then same thing. I'm like, great, I just got introduced to ayahuasca. Now I get to be sober for however fucking long, right? (laughs) And not get to participate because now I'm pregnant and all of a sudden, now I got to be on this like waiting hiatus of like, now what, you know? So anyways, that was, I thought, kind of relative to the the example that you gave and also kind of connected to um, what we're we're planning on also talking about with just like the journey and the medicine. And so it was kind of like an interesting segue and into motherhood and then having to balance the both. Well, let's talk about like, let's get into your experience with all of the medicine. Cause um, I mean, I have an interest in it. I know it's a part of my path in the future, whenever it presents itself in the safest format, I'll be able to go and, you know, blow my fucking mind and do all that stuff. But you do have, a lot of experience with it, not only ayahuasca, but bufo. So let's get into your mind getting blown over and over and over. And like, not only what you experienced in those circles with those facilitators, what you saw, but let's talk about the difficulties in integrating that information because the ego does come back in a logical sense and be like, that's your imagination. Spirit animals don't exist. You know, like you can't see that. Like, you know, that's, that's sci-fi, that's fantasy, like, it's, it is a little too much for, like, a beginner on any level, like, if you just picked up rose quartz the other day, you're probably not at spirit animal level yet, but plant medicine. conversation might be calculus for those individuals, because you blow your mind of what's possible, you know what I mean, like, Mm -hmm. if you're looking for, you know, your, 101 spirituality you know you may tiptoe into into a different conversation and be more able to relate to it you know i think 
what I might be sharing upon might be that those like, what the fuck is she talking about? Because I have no concept or frame of reference for any of it because you have not yet maybe tiptoed into a little bit of it to have a taste of what we may therefore discuss. And so, you know, to each one their own, wherever they're at in their journey, there's no good, you know, there's always a place to start. Mm -hmm. And there's always those that have been doing the work and that are advancing and what's possible for them. And, and, and I think the great part about your spiritual journey, there's no wrong time or place to start. And just a matter of who gets called into your field or if there's medicines that get called into your field is because part of you and your soul is ready to embark on whatever that next step is for you, no matter where you're starting and where you're at in that moment. And that's the cool thing about, I think, even the intelligence of these medicines and the intelligence of even your own higher guidance and higher self, if you were at least receptive and open enough to be guided in any sort of way, not because it's not there, you just may be blocked to receiving that. So if I were to start before getting into the medicines, I will kind of backtrack to where my path started, which was actually with the shamanic journey work. And that for me started happening to me and it was after having a surrender from my old path, realizing it didn't buy my happiness. And no matter where my fucking ego thought it was taking itself, it never was fulfilling until I had this surrender. And like, universe, show me a sign. What do I need to do? What are, where am I going? You know, what is my path? Um, and the intentions that I had set up that led my path to me that I feel like was pretty powerful was I want to do what I love and love what I do. So I never feel like I work a day in my life. So that was a good one. And um, and I wanted deep connection because I never had deep connection before. All I had when I was pursuing egoic pursuits, thinking that's what I was taught would buy happiness and I was never more miserable following that, is I was surrounded by superficiality. And it was all about, you know, what you do, who you know, what you make, all that bullshit surfacey conversations that was like killing me on the inside until I realized what am I expecting experiencing that I was able to identify was disconnection. So based on my understanding of like the law of attraction and the universal laws, which I got introduced to when I was 19 and had played with it, albeit at that time with ego, I'm going to make this much or meet so-and-so or create this opportunity to the point where I'm like, none of that mattered. None of that fulfilled me. And now what does that mean? I want, and I was able to shoot an arrow in the dark and be like, I want connection. I have no idea what that looks like, what that feels like, where I'm going to do, what it's going to even be like to do what you love and love what you do. And what is that? It was just, I just put that out in the universe and then my path started finding me and it just, start happening to me, which is the cool thing. So everybody else is on their journey and you're having these crises, you know, because you realized you picked a career out of a hat or you're working a job that's not in alignment with you and it's killing you on the inside, you know, start to ask those questions. What the fuck do I really want? You know, what is it that means I desire? If this isn't it, what does it mean I want? Not to try to answer the question of what that is, because that's when we put ourselves back in the box, but Ask your, your higher self, like, show me the way that's in most alignment to my highest growth, you know, whatever that next step is, whether that's just going on your journey, your spiritual journey, your healing journey, or whether that's, like, being willing to surrender the stuff you're attached to that is making you miserable and killing you on the inside, you know, that willingness to surrender, I think, is a powerful first step, and for me, at least, that was what changed my life, and where then my path found me and started happening to me. And so um, there's a few, I guess, you know, details in between, but, you know, without, like, going specifically after the details, I kind of want to just cut into the heart of it. And I, um, the things that I had cultivated my whole life is things that I kind of added in as these sideline services when, when I kind of started being, become made aware of where my path was heading, which was in the healing work. And the things that I developed since childhood would be things like I'd studied astrology since I was 12 because I was fascinated with people. I wanted to know what made them uniquely them, their, their unique lens of how they perceive reality, um, the filters that they engage reality. Therefore, what are they creating? Like all of that fascinating fascinating me, the universal laws, how do you then participate in the creation of your reality based on how you interact and perceive things, and then factor in your background and your past and the conditioning and, you know, your traumas and your shadows and all of that contextualizes, therefore, how you're, you know, 
interacting with your reality, the relationships that are drawn to you by virtue of what they're mirroring to you, therefore, what's already within you that you've probably not resolved, your, all your relationships are going to show you some aspect of you, the good and the bad and the ugly, right? But so is your reality, and so is your body. It's all interconnected, and that fascinated me, and like I said, kind of unfolded into this understanding of what I think led me to my path, which, um, you know, with the energy healing work is how it kind of started, but the more I started doing, like, Reiki and laying of hands, for me, these downloads started happening in the beginning, which I later found out was the clue to people's healings, as long as I stayed out of the way of my own ego who wanted to interpret on the behalf of them what that message was, because my ego wanted the upfront proof and didn't like the idea of being wrong, right, until my guides were then like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, you know, we don't want you to play messenger anymore, because then there's room for distortion, because, right, we give our authority away to other people if we feel like they are on a pedestal above us, you know, and uh, that can really alter someone's course, you know, like, for example, you know, you go to a doctor and they're like, you've got six weeks to live. Well, you're not fucking God, doctor, so why the heck are you telling this person what their mortality is? And because this person's now going to be like, well, clearly they went to school for 10 years, they know more about my body than my own self does, and I'm now going to die, and you've just given your free will away, right? So you can see how dangerous that is when our filters project a message, and that person's going to take on that truth, and it, unbeknownst to them, they're this powerful creator, they just fulfilled your fucking prophecy, not because that was really meant to be their outcome, but they accepted it, and they believed it, and so... There you go. That's their their fate is sealed in their own making, but it was infiltrated by that layer of perspective. So for my guides to kind of fast forward into that, they didn't want me to play that game no more. You know, so there's you no. Know, what's more important instead of being messenger, where you may withhold something because you don't want to be wrong, or you might filter it in a way that may distort the message. They said we don't want you to do that anymore. They said what's more important is that. People can find out that they can access their own higher guidance for their own self and therefore be the, their, be the sole interpreter of whatever that experience is and whatever they tapped into or connected to for themselves. And therefore what they choose to do with that moving forward is solely upon them. And that is how then I got guided into how to guide others in being able to access that for themselves and navigate their healing journey, which they later told me I can't call it Reiki anymore. They're like, and I'm like, well, if it's not Reiki, what is, it that I'm, what is it that I'm doing? And they're like, you know, you're facilitating shamanic journey work. And part of that revelation in my own self and my own journey into self-discovery of who am I and what makes me credentialed and, you know, to say, you know, or even be able to call myself, you know, this shamanic healer, if you will. We're saying, um, you know, this is my soul's work. You know, it's not my human's journey. My soul has done this work over and over. And um, where they said, I have been a shamanic healer uh, or a shaman and medicine woman in many lifetimes, in many forests, in many jungles with many medicines. And they said, um, in this lifetime, it's more about the reawakening and, and remembering of, of that, of that soul history to bring it about into this amalgamation in this lifetime in service. And so that's kind of how my path just started happening to me. And it's not because I was like, oh, I'm going to go study under this person or this institution to get these credentials so that you can feel confident in how I'm supposed to show up for you before you believe what I do or how I may play a role is going to benefit you in some way. That's not my story. You know, I'm like, my training came from the spirit realm communicating to me which at first was through me, but now it's through my clients where they then become the channel and the conduit for a lot of these connections. I merely guide them to access that. And then they're connecting to, you know, <clears throat> ascended masters like Kuan Yin and Mary Magdalene and Yeshua and, you know, um, Hathor and Isis and white buffalo calf women. And even my guys, I've had my, my client, a couple of my clients even channel you know, uh, my higher guide, Black Crow. So it's like this Native American Shoshone chief talking through, like, 
half the time white woman, you know what I mean? Like they're like these like suburbia women and like, mm, you need shaman drum and mm, you need to connect with white Buffalo cap women. And it's like, I don't know. It's kind of funny when, when, when he starts talking for whatever reason, it tends to be through women and he's uncomfortable in there. He's like, what is this? I'm like, female body parts. He's like, emotions. <laughs> emotions. That's funny. No, in the female embodiment. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, get me out of here. You know, yes. like, and then he's like, sends the white Buffalo calf woman, white, you know, white Buffalo calf, talk to these women, you know? <laughs> That's so funny. Emotions. Yeah. Yeah, he's like emotion. So anyways, what I'm trying to illustrate is like through the shamanic journey process, which is a soberly experienced journey of guiding your consciousness to bypass both mind and body to access these higher dimensional spaces and or deeper spaces within yourself where things like uh, healing, you know, your uh, inner, your inner traumas, your shadows, such as inner child healing and what I believe based on this work is that healing is always found at the root source of the original genesis or cause. And in order to do that, you need to be able to access that original timeline. And so when you're in this journey space, you're not limited by your human perception, not only of time, but limitation of physicality, because you are in this dimensional experience doing work on yourself on a soul level, and then able to access these timelines and be the one that intervenes where that original trauma took place save your fucking inner child self bring them to safety teach them how to protect themselves whatever happened to them so that they can then be able to forever alter that timeline and how that took effect in your so-called story that now limits you and triggers you and is you know the source of your fucking suffering in this lifetime because you weren't taught how to heal you were taught how to cope and coping is just a way of self-medicating or avoiding or escaping what you're not trying to look at or deal with because it's uncomfortable or painful. But the point is we have to teach people how to heal. And so that's one means of like possibility, say through the shamanic journey route is, you know, inner child healing or going to, into other incarnational spaces of other lifetimes and learning even from those lifetimes or even bringing them into healing and closure too, because granted you came into this lifetime with contracts and karma and, you know, ancestral generational shit that you inherited, that you also have the opportunity to do work not only for your own self, but affect every fucking timeline in in your existence by virtue of the work that you do on yourself, but also up the ladder and down the ladder ancestrally and generationally because of what you inherited that those that came before you, like a domino effect, passed on to you, that now all of a sudden you're inheriting and you have the choice of whether or not you're going to address those things because if not guaranteed your children and their children's children are going to continue to inherit what you and them don't fucking address and one day you're going to inherit that down the line as a future descendant of your own ancestry right so do the fucking work right mm -hmm. <laughs> and um so anyways that's kind of the stuff that's possible in shamanic journey work which really anything is possible which is fun for me because I get to learn alongside everybody I connect to and work with because they become this channel and we're making sense of what the heck is going on in this reality on the physical plane and the beyond in your own personal journey in life, what you need to know, what humanity needs to know, you know, including, you know, when 2020 hit, you know what I mean? Guaranteed questions were less focused on the self back then you know, like, oh, what's my purpose and where am I supposed to go? Now, all of a sudden, we're, we're all on board of, like, what the fuck is going on, right? And everybody started questioning on that, and same with my clients. And then we started getting answers channeled to make sense of the nonsense as to who's compromised, who's not. What do we need to know about vaccinations? What do we need to know about Trump? What do we need to know about Biden? What do we need to know about this war and that, this, whatever, you know? We went there and got to, like, get all this channeled perspective. So it's, like, this way of accessing higher truth when guaranteed we are highly censored, highly, you know, um, propagandized with fucking BS, right? And we were born into the system of nonsense. So for me, this has been a great tool in my own journey and discovery to get answers, like we're talking about playing Nancy Drew in the spirit realm to make sense of this physical realm and the beyond. And we were all piecing these pieces together with everybody I worked with piecing these pieces together. 
So that's the shamanic journey route. Now, that I did, I started eight years ago. Uh, was when my path on that level began um, in service, which, thank goodness, I think that that's how my journey began because I think it is very complementary to also support integration when working with plant medicine, which is another topic that I think is really important to touch upon that I don't feel like has had, you know, the appropriate support in medicine communities um, and those that have embarked upon, you know, uh, their own journey in exploration of being in the medicine communities may be able to attest to it. Maybe there wasn't always the appropriate integration support. And that's not to say that's everybody's experience, because I'm sure there's facilitators or shamans or practitioners out there that are doing integritous work and able to support that. But those are the things that I think should be brought into question for anybody who is newer or not even newer, but that are in the medicine communities to be made aware of the, the importance and the need for integration, taking the time to process and integrate whatever the medicine may have showed you or revealed to you because it doesn't always do the work for you. It can make a lot of progress, but it's not because it's going to do the work of uh, bringing it into your actuality for you. That's the day to day work. But sometimes the medicines can show you and reveal to you some intense traumas and maybe you have these epiphanies and realizations and healing that can come from that. But it can also open up a can of worms, you know, when you're made aware of maybe some childhood sexual trauma that you had amnesia around and all of a sudden medicine is showing you this stuff and why your life ended up the way it did. That can be fucking traumatizing for people. So knowing that you, you need to be able to also have an idea of what is integration and who can maybe support you in that if you were to pursue medicine work just so you have that in your arsenal because you don't know what your experience is going to be and it can be just glorious and beautiful and amazing and tapped in and full of fucking love which which is definitely you know a great experience when you get to have that but you're also there to do the work so that way what you can release empty yourself from and purge out the nonsense the yuck that yucky energy all that internalized stuff that you have taken on for many lifetimes not just this lifetime address this lifetime but many lifetimes we have this opportunity in this lifetime to fucking go after and heal and i would say the the medicines whether you consider them plant medicine or entheogen medicines um, are a powerful gateway as well to access what is needed for you because there are intelligent medicines and um, they do respond to your intentions. So getting clear on what are your intentions is another piece of advice I would give people that are going into exploration of that. What are you hoping to achieve? What are your intentions? Get clear on that because it's highly responsive to that. And secondly, don't just, and in, this is something to touch upon too, especially because where I live in Colorado, we just moved into legalizations of these, you know, medicines and psychedelics and whatnot. But I think there's a lot of concern for that because, you know, it's going to open up this can of worms, which is great on one level. It means more people are going to be able to explore what is possible for them, but potentially could be putting themselves and or others in, you know, vulnerable positions you know, uh, depending on what they are opening themselves up to. Because like I said, it is a gateway. And if you are maybe ignorant of, say, like, for example, in my, my experience, the spirit realm, you know, and if you are ignorant to the fact that just as much as there are these light beings and ascended masters and guides and your loved ones and your ancestors and your galactic star family, right, um, just as much as there is that working towards the betterment of humanity on our side, well, there's obviously also a spiritual battle that we've got going on to those that are aware and to those that aren't aware, it's what's going on. And, and, and if you, you know, were to discover some of those things, it'll explain why the fuck this world is in the state it's in because we are going through these dark nights of the soul for the great awakening to be made aware of the level of malevolency that has hijacked this planet, but not exclusive to this planet. And so as light workers, those that are awakening up into your purpose or those that have already been doing the work on their path, we're here to be a part of that change, to transmute 
and address the level of darkness that has been here. So whether you're super religious and you refer to it as Satan or Lucifer, there, there's some truth to that. Whether you're on your spiritual journey and you're like, refer to it as demons and entities and other fucking beings that are uh, ill intentions towards humanity, it is fucking true. There is that. And I've experienced it and I've encountered it. And in fact, I end up having to help people on that level as well. But if you are going avant-garde, like I'm just going to go trip on myself some mushrooms or whatever, you know, be aware that, you know, healing, and this is like me and you that have even talked about, it's not all just love and light, right? So don't be ignorant of that. Be aware that there are other energy that wish harm. And in my experience, and for those that I facilitated over the last you know, eight years working over probably a thousand people, the, you know, that was my first taste of what that was because I was hearing a common story and in people's traumas. And that is childhood, especially sexual trauma. You know what I mean? And I'm like, why is this the number one story? And come to find out when you access those original timelines and you're rescuing people's inner children, right? Um, Then you come to find out, well, these perpetrators aren't necessarily the human of what did it to them. It's where they themselves became taken over by these dark entities that work through the human, perpetuating this trauma, targeting innocence, targeting sexual energy, right? And then because the child is then the victim, oftentimes they cannot conceptualize what happened to them. And in many cases, they dissociate and have amnesia, which is why... Hence, a lot of people don't even always know that that's their trauma. And then maybe medicine is going to show that to you and you're shown, oh, my God, this is what happened to me. I didn't know this, but this explains so much. But another important key factor in this particular healing, if this is your story, whoever's listening, and you're like, you know, I'm aware that I have these traumas, whatever those traumas may be, um, is to be aware that it's not just the person that you think did it to you whether you're aware of the the who might be involved some some might not even know the who um but it's these these evil entities that compromise the vessel because why you left body you left your temple right you vacated the premises because your child conscience could not conceptualize of what was being done to it if it was a, a level of extreme trauma and such and that's how these energies can maybe infiltrate and take over where eventually, you know, that innocent child becomes the perpetrator because they became compromised with these entities and energies. And so, again, that is the spiritual battle that we need to be made aware of that's been happening here and that it is important to seek out the genesis of the healing that you yourself uh, are carrying um, because whether or not you are the one that then became the the perpetrator, right? Because of what started working through you. If not, you're still being targeted by these entities and energies, siphoned of your energy and further perpetuating a victim mentality, which therefore attracts to you relationships that keeps you in abusive situations, not because that's what you deserve or what you want or what you're asking for. It's what you're familiar with and you're attracting it to you because it's something that you've not yet healed or addressed. And that's something we all have the opportunity in this lifetime to go after. It's just we weren't taught how to. So whether that's like, you know, through what I facilitate and offer, through whether shamanic journey or plant medicines or somebody else that gets called upon in your path that holds space and that you trust, um, which, again, that's another point that I feel like is really important that um, is to use your discernment, use your intuition of <clears throat> Who do you trust yourself and the care of to hold space for you in something that could be a vulnerable journey, you know, whether that's a shaman or facilitator, whether that's the doctor even, which again, you know, maybe that's the container you feel safe because you're like, you know, spirituality is woo woo to you. And you're like, eh, I'd rather go to somebody that I know might be able to take my vitals if anything would go wrong. And maybe that to you is what's safest. However, question into that because what is that doctor's experience in holding space because what if for example you encounter you know an entity or realize you have an attachment are they equipped to help you spiritually with a spiritual medicine you know so really like question into who's the right 
space holder container person for you that's going to be able to support you in whatever that journey is um, that that you feel like you can be most open and receptive and trusting. But vet it, discern it, and if there's any red flags, trust your gut, trust your instinct, because if it feels wrong, it's probably wrong for you because even the shamans and the healers can become compromised. And when I say they can be compromised, they too can be infiltrated by, by the very dark ones that they're there to help you with. So pay attention to that because this is also something like I myself have had to learn in my own journey in putting myself in situations or circles uh, where I had to later learn that they were compromised and what that affected me with in certain psychic attacks um, by these, you know, dark entities that I also myself had to learn about. But again, it was because maybe that particular shaman or facilitator themselves weren't holding their own journey accountable to do the work on themselves to address their own shadows while then holding space for others. So same thing, those that are holding space, those of you in the medicine community, hold yourself accountable, have integrity, you know, really push integration with the people you're serving um, or make them aware that you are available for that and have the tools necessary so that you can assist them beyond just maybe the holding space with medicine. How can you help support them in integration or lead them to somebody that can uh, hold space in that regard? You know what I mean? Have those those people in your in you know in your tool belt that maybe if it's not your your skill set you can maybe lead them to somebody that can maybe help them uh with something that maybe you cannot even though that's not to say you don't have your gifts or um your offerings or your services or your modalities or your medicines and but, but again hold yourself accountable and hold those in the community accountable and those that are seeking you know vet the people that you're that you're looking to sit with and and question question them where do they get their medicine you know is it is it um uh sourced in a, in a sacred way you know like find those things out question those things and trust your intuition and discernment so um i don't know if you want to like interject there before maybe i touch base on maybe some of the medicine specifically but yes I do, but I love everything you're saying, so I definitely didn't want to interrupt anything. But there were a couple things that popped up that I think are, like, very, very great points. Um, but just from me not being so far away from what I feel is, like, the beginning, like, how a beginner feels when you're going into all this, whether, like, for you, for instance, like, you were really drawn to astrology and astronomy when you were a kid, when you advanced more in your journey like you understand why that was a part and why you're drawn to it it's like the divine like tapping on you so to speak like hey this is a part this is a part this is a part but when you're a beginner and you're going into these places especially with how commercialized spirituality is whether it's new metaphysical shops whether it's certification programs to just oh i got my 30-day certificate now i can do energy work on you or hey you know, I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, the easiest thing that you can do just because you're trained for that commercial as a commercialization is don't be enamored by the fact that someone calls them a fucking Reiki master because it doesn't matter if you have 500 certifications but you're not doing your own work you if you're a clear channel and a vessel but you're not doing your own work you're passing that bullshit mm -hmm. on to whoever you fucking touch mm -hmm. in and out of the world so there's so many people that give off red flags in the beginning, mm -hmm. but you deny those red flags because you're not to a strong point to trust your intuition and trust your discernment. Like your intuition is well, yeah, a really strong voice. For healing. And you, yeah, you really might be desperate for healing, whether you're like, you're going to go to a tarot reading and she happened to bring a, a conversation where you had with your grandmother that was warning you about this experience in the first and you get a high off of mm -hmm. having these experiences. You're like, oh, I need the answers. I need this. I need this. I need this. One, there's yeah, don't get enamored by their fucking titles in the spiritual world. Look out for their spiritual egos. Find out if they're doing their spiritual work. If the only thing that they present to you is that they're loving life and they figured out how to 
get through their blah, 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 and that's why they have this platform and do all this stuff. It's just like, can you tell me like what your bad days are like? Like, can you tell me the last time you had a bad day? Like, how vulnerable is the facilitator actually going to be with you before they actually facilitate you and hold your own space? Because I have... And how do they deal with shadows? Yeah, like I've been on sides where I was absolutely so enamored by the strength and the power and the way that they overcame their battles and the programs that they were presenting to people. And I wanted to work with them because one, I thought they would better me on my path. And two, like I also wanted to kind of be like their apprentice in a way. Like I was like, they have a piece of the puzzle, right? And the piece Mm -hmm. of the puzzle can't always be a good piece. Like you said, sitting in the circle and being like, okay, after I fucking did this, I found out that they were compromised. I have to go through that to revert it back to the mirror aspect, right? Like I'm like, well, how am I compromised? Can I be compromised? What are the ways that I can be infiltrated? Like, let's fucking audit myself. So you don't really, it's not like a victim mindset where you're like, oh, I'll fucking never work with them again because they have this and this, they have this. It's like, dude, that's a mirror for you. Like you don't, you don't get to sit here on your own fucking pedestal of, oh, I found out they were a fucking demon. Like I work with so many people. Like I really still do truly love and believe in the work that they're doing, but I don't think that they're healthy to go put it out there in the world, but I'm not going to go around bad mouthing them and being like, oh, I wouldn't fucking work with them because this and this and this. Now I've had a healing, like I've had a part of my healing where I felt like almost betrayed in a sense. And I was just like, I fucking trusted you. Do you know how hard it is for me to like be safe and be vulnerable and even like cry in front of somebody? And you're going to utilize that so you can fucking say your program works? Go fuck your fucking self. You know, like I've had those moments and I'm actually proud that I had those moments because that was still a part of me speaking up and doing that, whether it was out of an ego or whatever the fuck you want to call it. I still had those moments where after I did those practitioners where I wanted to get in that fucking mindset of just oh fuck them I will fucking burn you but I'm like no 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 no. like I don't really mean that like that's not the way I want to be but hey I'm reacting this way because I thought that I could be vulnerable with you I thought I could be safe with you and I actually found out that you were kind of just using me in whatever format you were to either elevate more of your spiritual ego or help mm-hmm. you with whatever you're mm-hmm. trying to pedal out in the world. But I had to go through that experience to then bring it back onto myself and be like, one, this isn't the way that I want to be. Okay, if I don't want to be that, I have to look at my shadow side and my ego and like, do I have a spiritual ego? Am I doing right. my work? Am I spiritually bypassing the work that I'm actually supposed to be working on that time? Or am I being like, oh, I feel bad today because fucking Capricorn's coming out and all this crazy fucking shit? Because it's really so fucking easy when you get all these divination tools presented to you that (laughs) you deny your own intuition because you pulled the fucking ace of pentacles that day, but then your bank account went negative (laughs) and you're like, what the fuck? I just pulled the ace of pentacles. Like they're supposed to like, this shit's supposed to happen. So it's so easily to get infiltrated with no matter what type of shit that you go through. And like, if you're a beginner and you're listening, you're like, is anywhere safe? And it's like, yes, it is. But you have to you have to really just continuously audit it really is exhausting but you still get released from the human experience like new levels new devils is the thing that kept repeating in my head when you kept talking mm-hmm. about every mm-hmm. time every time i leveled up this would happen because you're a fucking food source to the negative energy like they eat the light they suppress the light they want to overtake and the light yeah. doesn't want to necessarily overtake the darkness it's just like the darkness is void of love Okay, the light is love. The light is not condemning. It's not judging. It's not all these things. The light holds space for you to look at these shadow sides of yourself. Like, all these things. Like, okay, how many fucking times have I been a villain in this situation? Motherfucking hundreds. Like, how can you actually look at yourself and be like, was I ever the dark empath where I took information intuitively that I knew about you and I used it against you. Yes, I've done that. Have I manipulated people? Absolutely. On a subconscious level, I had no idea why I was doing that. Was I acting out of my traumas? Absolutely. Look Mm -hmm. in the motherfucking mirror and own that fucking shit and then be like, I don't want to be that anymore. Okay. I want to be a good person. I want to do good. I want to have this purpose. Yeah, it truly is a choice, but 
you got to face all the shit that you're not proud of and you're shameful of. And like one of my favorite things that I love to say to everybody that presents me with their trauma, like whether they feel like they're held back from the trauma, they're embarrassed, they're shameful, or they want to live in the victim mindset and blame the person who did that is it's just like what happened to you is not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. And like Hans Wilhelm pointed, like even from an energetic standpoint, it's like, If you condemn somebody for their actions on you, you're putting them in a prison cell. Every prison cell needs a guard. You literally just Mm -hmm. became the guard of your own perpetrator. Therefore, you Mm -hmm. connected an energetic line to them. And whether you're giving it or they're siphoning from you, you're still giving your free will, giving your energy away to that person. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. stand up for your motherfucking self. But, like, do good, be good, and know you're here for more than all of this bullshit that has been presented to us. Because 2020, I think the biggest thing that everybody got out of it is you're being fucking lied to on so many different formats. The water you drink, the food you eat, the TV you watch, the way that the world is formatted in general, the distraction concept of what Mm -hmm. the world has really become to Mm -hmm. as far as, like, the physical presence, like... Everybody was sitting there in the pajamas they wore for the same fucking seven days. Am I right? And you're like, <laughs> something doesn't feel right. Okay. I don't know what it is. You were yeah. sitting in those seven day pajamas. <laughs> yeah, right. Or like you're the person who had to do a Zoom call with a business suit and you were in your underwear and got up because how many of those fucking videos went around afterwards? But then my favorite thing about 2020 is how much people missed people. They missed the human connection. They missed seeing their relatives. Like people like outside their window, like FaceTime with their grandparents, but like fucking putting their hand up to it. Like I fucking bawled watching shit all over the internet, but I literally was watching videos of humans interacting with humans because I missed it so much. And we were all vibrating at such a low survival frequency that yeah, a lot of fucking crazy shit happened, but it brought us, we were forced to look at ourselves. We were forced to look at the fact we're like, well, how the fuck do I have a roof over my head when I haven't fucking worked in a year? That's weird (laughs) because I've been pulling 60 60 to 80 hours a week bragging about the fact that, oh yeah, I just put in 70 fucking hours a week. I just got a fucking commission check. Like go jerk yourself off. Nobody fucking cares. But when the world stopped, Everybody had to sit down and face their shit. And there were some people that woke up to it that's like, wait a minute, I can make money that doesn't take all this time and I can still have time for myself. People started picking up hobbies because what the fuck else were you going to do? You didn't have to work all day. And then they're like, oh, mm-hmm. they, they are connecting with their inner child and they're connecting with things that they thought they had to leave behind mm-hmm. to go be in the capitalistic society that we all have to thrive and survive in. So yes. 2020 definitely had its lot of positives for the Eckhart Tolle thing, like the flowering of human consciousness. And then mm-hmm. after the world started moving again, which it fucking had to, right? People were like, I'm not going back to work. Okay, you pay me bullshit. My rent's going up. My food's going up. But my pay isn't going up. My fucking taxes are going up. But my pay's not going up. Like, mm-hmm. in minimum wage is bullshit, like how less Mm -hmm. you get paid. And then we're like, okay, well, we're going to raise minimum wage. Okay, well, if you raise minimum wage, that's super great. But now everybody's bitching that your job isn't worth that amount of money. And then now, okay, well, hey, if we raise minimum wage, well, now we're just going to raise rent and goods and taxes again. We're always going to make sure that that fucking (laughs) gap is there for you. Yeah, right. Like, okay, cool. McDonald's wants to pay people $15 an hour. How are they going to make up for that? They're going to raise their motherfucking prices. That's what's going to happen. The people that they source their food from are going to raise their that dollar menu anyways, so (laughs) the Happy Meal ain't happy no more. (laughs) All I'm saying is if you can get 10 McNuggets McNuggets for a dollar, like, let's think about what is actually, is that fucking Mm. chicken at this point? Is it? Is it? (laughs) Is it, because like I get it, I had McDonald's two weeks ago at two in the morning and I was delighted. I was like, bless the shit to the nourishment of my body. Thank you so much. Don't feel bad at all for eating carcinogen food. This will not give me cancer. This will go through my body. I I believe in my immunity, like whatever I have to do. But I'm not going to regret this later. I'm not going to regret this later. I'm not going to regret this later. (laughs) You know, and I like, I really have to work through like the shame of eating like the poison food, you know, but 
so and many introspections too. where I was able to before happy break out because rent went up and the burgers went up and now I'm forced to eat the shit that I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> But seriously, though, like those are just like the common struggles of like tapping into all of these like questions about what the fuck is going on. And like, yeah, I mean, it can activate. We should question. We should question. Yeah. Question everything. Absolutely. But like your ego is like, no, 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 everything's fine. Like you don't want to be labeled this. You don't want to go against that. You'll lose this person. You'll lose this. Like there's so much fear in evolving. Growing does feel really lonely. You lose people that have been in your life for years because like Mm -hmm. you, you can't really like connect with them anymore. And even though you love them, you're on the right side of the demarcation line. And then you're like, I can't agree with you because you're on the left and I can't agree with you because you're on the right. Mm -hmm. Oh, what happened to you? I liked you better when you drank and ate processed foods and shut the fuck up. And it's just like, well, now I eat healthy. You know, I'm responsible for this vessel. Like, as you would say, like, my body is my temple, you know, all that fun stuff. But it's like, growing is really lonely. Like, finding out the truth. There are so many parts. Like, I know they say there's like five stages of the dark night of the soul. I don't really know. I can't really speak on like how many times you can just have an ego death and break and break and break and lose and like vibrate higher. Um, that could be a, a completely well, different episode, right? But, well, go, go go to your plant medicines and you'll find out. <laughs> yeah, right? No shit. So, like, I had, a, I had a friend that I was, like, talking to and I was explaining my spiritual awakening to him. And I was very scared to tell him because there's been so many things that I've presented to him and, like, my direct experience or the way that, like, consciousness works for me. And he's just like, so what you're basically saying is like, everything's meaningless. Like everything I'm doing in my life is meaningless. This is meaningless. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I was like, it's not meaningless. I was like, but it's not exactly what you came here to do. I was like, you did need to do it. Like the ego needs to evolve to a certain point to fill itself up. And then you're like, okay, I got everything I got. I have the job. I have the wife. I have the kids. I have the house. I have the car. But then why am I still miserable? Yeah, but why am I still miserable? Like, why am I like, why am I in this fucking business suit and all these jerk offs are talking about their fucking golf score? Like, ooh, fucking awesome! Hey, look at this boat I bought. Look at this vacation I went on to. It's all like, like you said, it's all very superficial. And you're like, why am I dying inside? But then you don't want to look in the mirror because you don't recognize yourself anymore. And then you start feeling pitiful mm-hmm. and mad and trapped and blah, 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 blah. Like that and then, is and the you're in, oh, no, that student loan debt the from the bullshit career yeah. that you don't even want to. Right? Yeah. Like I need you to go to school, pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, but you, uh, you probably won't get the job on the field that you went to. So you'll probably go into the service industry and your parents told you you, you had to go, go to college. Because, because, if you go because that's all you're going to hire anybody with no experience. <laughs> Seriously, I can't tell you how many times I was growing up. They're like, yeah, you have to go to college. Otherwise, you'll be asking everybody, do you want fries with that for the rest of your life? So there's this derogatory concept on certain parts of work and certain jobs. So like you're even trained, like your job is your identity. And like, it'd be like, oh, he's a doctor. And it's like, well, he's a good fucking person because he's a doctor. And it's like, that's Mm -hmm. not really the case. Like your job isn't your identity. Just like their thoughts, you aren't your thoughts. Which breaking mm-hmm. away from that, which you could ultimately say like breaking out of the matrix, however you want to say it, very fucking depressing. Okay, you mm-hmm. miss your old self, you miss your old habits. I miss because it was easier when you didn't know. It was oh, easier when you were ignorant. So fucking easy, yeah. Like ignorance is bliss. Absolutely true. I get jealous of normal people all the fucking time that never ask why. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. How do you fucking survive not questioning anything? How do you have such blind faith in shit you don't understand and just continue through life? And you're like, oh, this is the way it is. This is And they just like regurgitate this bullshit programming. And I'm like, I know I can't sit at this table anymore, but I just want all of you to know that I love you so much. Like when I don't, when I don't sit here anymore, it's not because I don't want to be around you or anything, but it kind of is because I don't want to be around you. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm so sorry. (laughs) Like I really do love you, but... At this point, I can't understand with the level of information that we're able to fucking access. We don't have to go dig through fucking caves and find the Dead Sea Scrolls anymore to see what the but friars were doing. That's how sophisticated the, the censorship is. That you don't need to burn books. They just need to like algorithmically censor and deplatform and Woo! shadow ban you because you speak anything that's remotely true while you know being discredited because you're not 
promoting the mainstream narrative owned by the same six conglomerate corporations, mm -hmm. which are tied to, you know, the conspiracy, you know, Illuminati, Cabal, oh. Deep State, whatever the fuck you want to call oh, them, owning your perceptions, telling you what to think and believe. Mm -hmm. Since the day you were fucking born, you were born into their system, and you got to ask yourself why. why. Well, because you're their fucking slave. Do they want to let you off the mental plantation? No, they do not. So if there's a discrepancy between you and what these other people are saying, maybe just investigate both sides mm -hmm. and then maybe come to your conclusion instead of being blindly filtering and accepting all the nonsense and be like, my perspective is so true because look, CNN says it is. Well, mm -hmm. CNN is bullshit. They're fucking compromised 100% and so is all mainstream media. I wouldn't trust any of it. Social media, all, all of it's oh, compromised. it's so depressing. I remember I mean, when they have good agendas towards you, and you want to believe that they really want to put all this good stuff in your body and force you to do it. Well, if it was so fucking good for you, why do they need to force you to do it and mandate it? Mm -hmm. You should be volunteering if it was so great for you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. The minute you try to force somebody into anything, that's tyranny. Why aren't you questioning that? And if you're questioning it, then fuck yeah, good for you, because more people need to question shit. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, mm, write the 100% fucking emoji all over the screen right now. I'm picking up what you're throwing down for sure. But yeah, question, <laughs> question, ask why, ask why, ask okay. why. And again, you want to ask including why. Your spiritual journey. Including for your spiritual journey. Fucking do it. Yeah. And again, like, they're, okay, so, like, the thing that I ran into a lot is, like, you know, there's, like, spirituality 101, getting into stuff and finding your purpose and finding your path. So, like, I'm interested, like, you and everything. Like, the Nancy Drew thing that you told me, I was like, oh, girl, I feel you so hard on that. I just want to understand and know. And, like, the more you know, the more you don't know. Like, you're never going to get to a point where you know everything. But I was just like. Yeah, the more answers you get, but the more questions you're going to get. Yeah. Because then you're gonna, but you have never to take it out into the world and still have that direct experience. Just like if you're meditating on your mat or on your pulser, like, whatever the fuck you sit on, you're like, oh, God, like. I'm finally tapping into the way that I want to feel and the way that I want to present myself in the world. And I want to be more compassionate and I want to be all loving. And then you go out in the world and somebody fucking tests you and you're like, I do not wish a motherfucker would, but they just did. And I don't want to act like my old self, but I'm not really skilled enough to be compassionate yet because I'm still finding my voice and I'm trying to stand up for myself. So if you want to be more compassionate, the world is going to send you things to make you more passionate. And it's probably going to be a dickhead at Walmart or Target. You're like, the, why the fuck? Like when people are mean to me, because I, like, I always say I'm a golden retriever in a body, I'm like, what made you go out of your way to be such a fucking prick? Like, <laughs> how do you know I'm not a serial killer? And I'm going to take your fucking license plate and come to your house tonight and be like, hey, remember me, Bob? Yeah, you messed with the wrong one. Like, how do you fucking know? Like, why would you go out of your way to be such a dick? And then now I'm like, oh, well, it's probably his generational trauma. It's probably his untapped inner child issue. It's probably the girl that broke his heart and he became a misogynistic prick. It's probably... And, like, I try to just run down this fucking list of, like, why I need to be compassionate to this motherfucker that was just getting all up in my face, which getting up in any woman's face is just like completely disrespectful in my opinion. I have a bubble, fuck off, right? But there's so many times where I'm like, I like get off the mat and I'm like, yay, like I'm at the frequency I want to vibrate on. Fucking, I went out in the world one day and got rear-ended. And I was a stoplight. I was a block away from work. And I had already torn my meniscus the week prior. So I'm stopped and when, I know I've told the story now before. Now you made you go, now, now you're grumpy. <laughs> oh my God, I was so grumpy because I already didn't want to deal with the injury anyway. I have this fucking inflated knee brace on me that I'm super fucking pissed I have to wear. And then as I'm stopped, when the girl rear ends me, it retwists my meniscus even more. So like I literally look up at the sky and I go, what the fucking fuck? And I don't want to go back to her and be like, you fucking hit me, did it, like I got out of the car and I was like, can we like pull over and do this? And she's like, I am so, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I was like, I just want you to know, like just setting the tone of this conversation, you are not getting the best version of myself. I'm not mad at you. I was like, I just don't want to fucking deal with this. I was like, I already got out of the car looking like Forrest Gump. I'm not going to sue you. I'm like, but now I have to take my car to a body shop. I have to call my insurance company. I have to get a rental car. I have to wait for my car to be fixed. Like, I don't want to do this. I'm like, but I'm not mad at you. I don't blame you. And she was so fucking mind fucked by me not being mad at the whole situation. She was like, 
how can you be so nice right now? She's like, I literally rear-ended you. And I was like, well, to be honest, I'm highly intuitive and it looks like your life's fucking falling apart. So I said, this isn't a good situation for you either. And I have to go into work and, like, file a police report, man. I don't fuck with the popo. I don't like doing this shit, even when I'm like, hey, help me, police report. So then I messaged her the next day, and I was like, hey, are you okay? Like, do you have whiplash or anything? Her seven-year-old son was in the car. Is your son okay? Is everything okay? Her immediate response was like, I'm so confused. I hit you, and you're checking up on me. I'm like, because you experienced a trauma, too. You didn't wake up that day and go, I'm going to rear in the bitch on maze. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to fucking hit her car and blah, 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 blah. I said, and walk away. Like, yeah. Like, and what, uh, and whatever. I was like, maybe the universe wants to have us mar Maybe the universe wants us to be friends and have margaritas. And this is a fun little story. We'll tell people moving on down the road. And she was like, seriously, if you want me to buy a margarita, like, let me fucking know. And I'm there. And I was like, well, I need my car fixed and I need my knee fixed. So I won't be putting alcohol on my system right now because I need like my body to heal itself. I was like, but I'll let you know. I never ended up having margaritas with her, not because, like, I didn't want to, just because it never really presented itself, and I'm really big on my intuition presenting anything to me, and if it's not for my highest good, it doesn't vibrate in my fucking field, unless it's fucking karma, and I'm like, oh, all right, let's get through this shit quick, because I got some fucking good shit to do, but there's this misconception in spirituality and in elevating that you're going to be untouched and you're not going to have these battles and you're going to be free from human suffering. Fuck that right now. It's going to hurt more because you're more right. empathetic and you're more loving and you're understanding and you see the suffering of the world more. And it's fucking weird. But guess what? And you need, to carry, you need to carry more shit and you have to purge more stuff. So when you work with the medicines, you're constantly purging. Yes. Purging on behalf of yourself and the collective. I mean, oh my God. Well, okay, so before we purging, how much I end up purging, it's ridiculous. Great that you bring up purging. So let's talk about ways that you would recommend proper purging. Um, obviously, integration is super important after these things because, oh my gosh, <laughs> like if you see too much, it could literally shoot you back into your comfort zone. Even if it's not good for you, even if like in the medicine, in the conversation, in the realization, you're like, oh, this isn't good for me. This is a person I need to break. This is a relationship I need to leave. This is a food I need to leave. Like it doesn't really matter even if you see the truth because you're so scared and the unknown is more scary than the known. So yeah, you can go back to your comfort zone, but like for you, especially being a facilitator of this, like what do you recommend for um, the purging. So, so it's not for, so purging is a byproduct of being on the medicine. So, uh, so it's not something you prepare to purge, but, uh, but to understand what type of purges may come about in a medicine experience, maybe how you may, uh, mentally prepare yourself for what could be possible, I guess, in how you may release what isn't serving you. And, and in a lot of like the like indigenous communities, they use the term panema, releasing negative energy. So panema is another way of saying negative energy, that which does not serve you. Um, so when you're talking about in preparing for medicines, you know, some medicines may have dietas, which is diets leading up, or, you know, you can't be on certain medications like antidepressants and, and things like that because it could be contraindicatory of, say, working with like ayahuasca or, you know, even um, bufo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, to preface to say the experiences that I, the experience that I have in working with medicine, I started my medicine journey. I kind of touched upon that with my, um, at least with ayahuasca back in the beginning of 2016, then got pregnant and then had to like, you know, kind of Thank intercept, you, you know, that in between with, you know, motherhood and, and, and the medicine journeys and facilitation. So there was a lot of like balancing and still pursuing my journey. Cause I was gung ho. I was like, fuck yeah, I can't wait till like I'm like pump this shit so I can go, you know, sit in ayahuasca, you know, um, you know, I had to bring my pumps to those ones too. Cause I was like still breastfeeding and I was just like, you know, but anyways, for anybody that might be judgy, don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> you'll know, you'll know what I mean when you've had a profound medicine experiences and then you're like, yes, my kids probably need this milk. Actually, <laughs> am I really going to toss this out? <laughs> <laughs> this is probably going to enlighten them. Um, enlighten anyways, them. so, yeah, I worked with grandmother and, and helped, you know, assist in ceremonies for the first few years. 
um, until eventually I got called to my own facilitations. And um, for the last, like, I'd say three or four years, I've also worked more with, the like, mushrooms, uh, holding ceremony with that and um, and holding space, and, and both one-on-ones or, like, intimate in couples or, like, intimate groups, um, which then led me to um, working with, eventually, Bufo, um, and not only in receiving, but then in facilitation. And Bufo is the um, Bufo alvarius toad medicine. So it's the secretion that is extracted from this particular toad, and it's uh, smoked, so you inhale it. It's through an inhalation, and it's basically a pure DMT with other molecular properties in it, such as like bufotine, which makes it its own unique medicine. And Bufo has you know, uh, the reputation of being considered a breakthrough medicine. It's very powerful at getting you very quickly out of your own way to release and have a breakthrough, tap in in a profound other level. And and the, the other thing I like about Bufo, uh, especially in context of also being a mother, um, is the fact that it's a quicker experience. Grandmother Ayahuasca... Um, so ayahuasca is known as the grandmother medicine, as well as like mushrooms, you're really committing to like the longevity of the, of the duration of the journey. Um, in which case mushrooms could be like a, you know, an average six to eight hours sometimes, you know, depending on, you know, your dosage and how deep in the medicine, medicine space you are on what journey it might take you into. Same thing with grandmother. It, you're on there in a duration of a journey, which usually you take in, um, different doses you know so you might layer the doses but usually it's an overnight experience so you're staying up all night when you're a mother what do you not get already you don't get sleep now you're going on this fucking journey and you're not getting any sleep and then and then you know how hard was it to even get the time off so you could go do the work on yourself right and then you go back and are they really forgiving so you can take the time to integrate you know guaranteed you know your partner or whoever's watching your kid is quite ready to give you your kids back and your kids are going to be like oh mom i know you went on this journey and i'm just gonna like let you sleep and take your time and integrate they ain't fucking doing that so you're going from this journey where you got your, like, the shit beat out of you, you know, in different ways, and you got all this love and guilt, and you're like, oh, my God, my kids, I'm so sorry I wasn't at home, and that, you know what I mean? And then you're like, you know, but I'm doing this for you, and whatever you're tapping into, and uh, et cetera, however you experienced your journey, you know, whatever your intentions are, whatever she wanted to show you. But then you got to go home, and you still got to then be that. So if you're the mom, you got to go home and be mom, and, you know, like, it didn't matter that you didn't get any sleep and you didn't get to recover. And you're, it's, it's a, it's kind of brutal at that point because you're so fucking tired to begin with. You went in tired and then you got no sleep and you're still not going to get to really recover. So going back to Bufo, each dose is like five minutes to 30 minute experience. So, you know, on average, maybe you, you may go in up to three times, you know, and you set the dosage. And granted, depending on who's facilitating you and how long, you know, they may, like the way I hold space, I still like to set aside like three to four hours um, because I don't like to rush time. But at the same time, like, there's no lingering effect where you're like, am I going to be able to drive afterwards or I got to like, you know, recover from this, at least on the sleeping portion of it. That's not the case. So for, for me, I'm like, fuck, I wish I was introduced to Bufo a lot sooner, and I wish I wasn't scared to have tried it a lot sooner, because, man, I would have, like, had this monumental exponential growth in such a short amount of time a lot earlier in my life, and I would have had maybe at least some sleep, you know, where, where you know, intermittently between, like, you know, cafeteriaing the kids, right? But anyways, so Bufo is great for that aspect, because it's quicker you can experience this breakthrough profundity of feeling like you address some lifetimes worth of stuff in such a short amount of fucking time and the amount of growth that that creates and ripples out not only in your internal reality but how that may change your fucking life because it ripples out and has no but choice but to have that mirrored back to you somehow in your life matching the growth and what you're now beginning to vibrate at because you're no because you release some heavy deep karmic stuff, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really profound medicine for that reason. And so as you can tell, I got pretty like passionate because it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, um, not to say you can't have intense fucking experiences, 
You can also have amazing, beautiful experiences with all the different medicines. So how you may experience, going back to the question of purging and releasing, you may release in different ways and depending on the medicine as to what's more commonly experienced in that type of purge. I would say, you know, m mushrooms, ayahuasca, and bufo, uh, you know, ch chances are you may purge their throwing up. They all may likely have that if you needed to purge or in my case, as a facilitator, a lot of times I'm also purging on behalf of the client. I'm like pulling these energies out, and that's how my body is working as a conduit and vessel to help you release what may be stuck in you or maybe where you might be resistant letting go of, especially if you also have a resistance to the idea of purging, which most people do upon first going into medicine because you're like, I'm not going to throw up. You know, they can judge yourself. I did it, you know, but that's a one common way of purging, crying. You know, whether it's those monstrous tears, like those, like, crocodile Dundee fucking tears where they're just gushing and it's like a fucking river. Yeah. And then you'll, and then it may, like, start to trickle down. And then you might even notice, like, how there are these, like, angelic te tears, like, just lightly feathering down your eyes. And you're just watching them drizzle down. And it's so light and feathery. And you're like, oh, my God, these tears are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you've had those experiences. And that can be on any of the medicines. <clears throat> You may release energetically. Your body may move energy. Uh, you may uh, scream. Although I have not experienced this or witnessed this with ayahuasca or uh, mushrooms, uh, not to say that it can't happen that way, but bufo screaming, like deep fucking guttural, blood curdling potentially, you mean releasing. And that was my first two experiences with the medicine was screaming i didn't know i was a screamer but that's how it what i was recently uh, releasing was coming out through that means as well and i was like quite shocked that that was the case that i was even capable of screaming like that you know what i mean but it was just so liberating and freeing and it tied to like ancient fucking times not even this lifetime but the hold that say these other lifetimes had over me that has followed me to this day needed to break these curse-like energies to release me and or what I was being a conduit for helping release on, say, behalf of, like, Mother Gaia, Pachamama, who's been internalizing a lot of these dark energies of what's been happening on her planet. And so it's kind of like when you're working on this level, you're not just doing the work for yourself. You're doing it for your fucking ancestors, your children, your children's children, you know, your brothers and your fucking sisters on this planet that are done being done and tired of like suffering here why the fuck did our souls decide to re to incarnate here just so we can fucking live to work and work to live and then you die while you suffer the whole time who signs up for that no it's fucking powerful light workers that said i came here to fucking be the change and i'm gonna forget who i am as this light being and i'm gonna have to go through this darkness so i understand darkness so i know what i'm here to change and transmute when i eventually wake up to my light as long as i didn't you know get taken over by the dark along the way or eventually say you know i don't want to live here anymore and say i want to go back to the spirit realm you know people do that because it's fucking hard but that's not why i think we came here is to fucking suffer but we had to understand what's been here creating suffering so we can go after that in the spiritual battle if you are aware so you can do the work but start with yourself because that's when you become the light and be able to help lead others out of their darkness into the light because you know how to walk through that dark night of the soul yourself because you did it now you can be that beacon of light for others because you had to go through the, your own fucking darkness to get there. And so you know then how to lead others out of the way. And then that's how you change and create this ripple effect for the world. So when you're doing your work on yourself, it's not in fucking vain and it's not just for you. It's benefiting everybody. And that's why we fucking do it. And you have this sense of knowingness and interconnectedness and telepathy even of knowing why you're doing this on some sort of level when you're tapping into those medicine spaces. And I feel like anybody that has already explored that knows what I mean, because you'll know what I mean when you have that experience. Even though you may not be able to explain your experiences sometimes to some people, you're like when you try to explain what is bufo and what can you explore, it's really hard to explain that experience because it's so mind-blowing and profound that words can't fucking do it justice. And there probably isn't even words that exist to explain it but if you go to somebody who says, you know, like I did Bufo too, I don't know what you experienced, or even ayahuasca, whatever, but I get it. 
I know. I know why you don't have words. You know, and there's this level of understanding of the work and the willingness to show up and do the healing and do the work. But yes, going back to integration, you may need to integrate that stuff and whatever you need to do to do that, whether it's something simple as taking the time to you, go journal, go out in nature, meditate, go in the bath. Maybe that's all you need, right, to process. But maybe your shit was intense and you need to go a little bit deeper than, you know, know that there are, you know, put yourself in the position where you can seek out those resources or check with the facilitator to see what do they offer in that regard. Um, I know for me, I'm not, you know, you know, whether that's through me, my means is to do integration is the shamanic journey route. You know, because we can get a lot of work accomplished, irrespective of whether you do medicine or not. Like, we can go there soberly. That's cool to know, too, that if you are afraid of the unknown, which most of us are, you know, afraid of trying a new medicine because you're afraid of not being in control, which, again, if if you are a controlling person, you especially probably need the medicine to get you out of your own way because control is a fucking sucky, yucky energy, which what? limits your expression and puts you in the position to limit everybody else's expression and their truth and their essence because now you want to suffocate them for the need of your control and we do that to our kids even when we when we know we're doing it you still sometimes can't help but doing it because they're so crazy and wild you're like can't you just chill and sit still can't you just not be you right now right we do that even though we don't want to do that and then you're like admit that we do it admit that you do it Catch yourself when you do it and try to change that you're doing that. doesn't mean you're going to stop doing it right away. Mm -hmm. You're just going to catch yourself more, and you you might beat yourself up. I'm like, oh, God, there's my control again. I'm doing it. But also challenge the control, your own control over yourself, the control that society has over you, you know. And this is something that, too, it's like recognize your own authority. This came through in a – in an ayahuasca journey over the summer where it was basically reminding me because the shaman was a little compromised that I came to figure out, right? But he was projecting his truths and been serving the medicine for 30 years. And so he was kind of fucking egoic and big cocky person in that regard. And I think there's a difference between confidence and cockiness. And from my perspective, there were definitely was a lot of shadow aspects that he needs to look at in his own self. But the message that came to me during the medicine in that particular ceremony it was be careful who you put on a pedestal above you there should never be any authority above your own authority hence those examples i gave you whether it's the fucking shaman that's been doing serving medicine for 30 years they can also have blind spots they can also have falsehoods they can also be compromised so don't just accept what they're telling you just because you think oh that must be like all knowing because they've been sitting with this powerful medicine for 30 years Because chances are there could be that to look at. And you need to be able to trust your own self, your own authority, your own intuition, your own level of discernment. Is that the truth for you? Is that the right person that's going to honor you and hold the container that you need? Question that. Same thing. If your fucking doctor is telling you you're going to die in six weeks, six months, whatever, fucking challenge that. They're not God. You are your own authority you decide when you're ready to fucking kick the bucket not them just because they went to school for 10 years don't give your power away right if you feel like you want to get answers from a spiritual level you know use your discernment before you just go sit with that psychic or medium and question the filters that they're giving you the message through because maybe they have things they need to take a look at and they're giving you a message telling you you know your soulmate's name is joe now next thing you know what'd you do you let that infiltrate your free will and you're waiting around for Joe your, you know, your whole life and you, you know, didn't give any guy a fucking chance because their name wasn't Joe and then you got stuck with who? You know, Joe Schmo and he treats you like shit or whatever. You know, maybe he really wasn't your soulmate. Maybe her channel was distorted. Next thing you know, you owned that truth and created a reality based around an intervention of your free will because you didn't discern it and come into your own higher truth and higher knowing for your own self and what you do with it. So be careful who you give your authority away to, your power away to, question all of it, trust your intuition, do your due diligence, use critical thinking, and discern for your fucking self. That's my biggest advice in anything, in any new information you've exposed to, but also, yes, in who you begin to trust yourself 
in in your healing, your spiritual journey, whatever, because there are also predators. I'll give you this one more example in sheep's clothing. <clears throat> like, for example, uh, I had two clients, and I think they went. They, well, you know, they did go to this particular same person. Now they both had suffered you know, uh, childhood sexual trauma. So they were desperate for healing, went to some, you know, self-entitled shaman that was serving, you know, mushrooms or whatever. And come to find out he dosed them eight grams, which is way too fucking much to be dosing somebody in medicine, but then sexually molested them on the medicine. So he was a predator hiding behind a spiritual mask of I'm here to help you heal. Meanwhile, they are, you know, basically re-traumatizing them and perpetrating, you know, them while they're on medicine. So there are uh, wolves in any uh, industry, not just this one, you know, and obviously I'm talking on this one because this is an arena that I, that I, I feel like passionate to talk about and what I've had to learn and discover via my own means. And, you know, I'd rather people not have to learn the hard way those lessons or be um, steered away from their healing because they're afraid that this situation may happen to them. And I don't want to say these things to scare people from trying something that could actually be very beneficial and life changing for you because these medicines are that they are, you know, and it's not right for everybody, you know, um, and it's your the spiritual path and journey may not be. For you or might not be for you right now and that's okay too you kind of have to see you know seeds might be planted right this conversation might be a seed being planted that you are made aware that they even are an option out there that you can try toad medicine or grandmother ayahuasca or mushrooms or peyote or san pedro and all these other available you know intelligent medicines that mother gaia offers you that you didn't have to make in some fucking laboratory, you know, and create some sort of addictive nature to them that's, you know, alters you in some way that now all of a sudden you need 10 other prescriptions just to fucking offset the symptoms that they give you, right? Like, go after the why you needed to be on medication in the first place, which is why plant medicines are an amazing gateway because they can help you in so many profound ways that your human mind and consciousness may not even be able to grasp in possibility and these medicines will show you possibility beyond your imagination and potential in healing whether it's a tough experience because you have to face your shadows or whether it's a glorious one where you get to fucking see your truth and your beauty and how fucking powerful and amazing you are and you got to see that or experience that on some level i don't know that's going to be your journey to find out and each time you go in it's going to be different but you're finding out who you are and you're getting closer to your truest self, the more you peel back those falsehoods and layers and purge and release and tap in and know whatever that is for you. And I would encourage people to explore that. Just be safe doing it. Just make sure you vet those that are the ones that are proclaimed to be the ones holding space for you. And if you're the people that are now trying to put yourself in a position of holding space, Make sure you have the right fucking intentions as to why you're doing it. And you're not just the doctor that's now trying to jump on the bandwagon because now you want to be the authority on how people access healing when that industry is the very reason they had to seek healing half the time in the first place because how they've been poisoned so much by Big Pharma working through your fucking industry that you got schooled by that you're just regurgitating and not questioning either because you yourself got caught up in the fucking programming and... Maybe your intentions meant good in initially, but did you get compromised because you you got programmed along the way? Now maybe 2020 is waking you up when you had to see people maybe being jabbed to death. You know what I mean? And be like, maybe I should question, you know, what what who's my authority, right? Well, maybe I should. And question if that's why you're taking me plant medicine, you want to hold safe then great, because you're like, I want to challenge the industry that I got indoctrinated to, because I'm like, I see this is actually doing more good than any of this, and if your intentions are in the right place, then make sure you develop a relationship to that medicine, and you're not just doing it because you want to be the authority, or it's a money-driven thing, you know what I mean? Make sure your intentions 
and motivations are in the right place for the betterment of the healing of the person that's going to be potentially sitting with you. Anyways, no, you're fine. that was my little yeah. rant. Everything, <laughs> everything you say is, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Uh, the thing that I always thought was weird, um, obviously, about, like, all of the C talk and the V talk is the way that they used propaganda against your own natural immunity and the way that your body was designed to work to fight off infections, whether they're, like, new to your body or not. Yeah, like, I thought it was weird how... Like, wherever people are getting their information from, because I definitely have my own beliefs, but, like, just in the mother's journey alone, if a mother is breastfeeding and she becomes sick while she's breastfeeding, the body produces antibodies in the breast milk and feeds it to the baby. If the baby is in utero and the mother is sick, there are things in the baby that could be sent to the sick parts of the mom to help her. There is so mm. much stuff about DNA and the cells in our body and the ways that our body work that the human vessel is miraculous on its own, even if you just took the soul aspect out of it. And I think that it was awful for people to lose the faith in the science of their own body, in the correct science of their own body. Um, the way that people gave into it through fear is what made me really sad or you have to do this or you'll lose your job. Like all of these fucking things. Like if it's good for you, my free will shouldn't be taken from me on a good for me basis. And right. Or good for everybody else's sake. Yeah. Let like, me, let me go against the unfamiliar for this illusion of benefiting or not harming someone else, mm -hmm. which is, which is just manipulation mm -hmm. it's manipulation yeah it's awful and i mean i definitely don't want to take the conversation the that direction because fuck it it's already had too much exposure anyways like ugh, we're talking about good stuff um but, but you, you but bring up again, a lot of valid yeah oh 100 percent valid yeah i'm not trying to be like mm, yeah but um the <laughs> thing that i get a lot from the poisoned misguided shamanic thing is a lot of them have unchecked desires like I can say that the people I've worked with that at the time like I really wanted to work from with them in a way and then the more that I was around them they had unchecked desires that they tried to like put through a spiritual channel that it was like oh it's okay it's okay it's okay or they realized that they hadn't even un like checked these desires and then they were harming people because they want to be the facilitator, because they were denied for so long. And now that they're in on this pedestal, like people are idolizing them and thinking they're so great and this and this and this. And like that part of yourself that you haven't healed is showing up in the good in a way. So like right. the, the fucking shaman that dosed people and molested them, like how do you know that guy like never had fucking attention in his life. A woman never fucking paid attention to him. Now when he starts fucking using medicine as a facilitator, he has all of these women just being like fawning over him and all of that. And that we're talking about the desire. Nexium stuff too. Remember, yeah. I think we had that conversation about the yes, cult thing. Yes, exactly. I literally, because everybody was like, like everybody's first impression of him was like, no, stay away, ooh, gross. But they were still able to get indoctrinated into his po programs. If you're listening and you haven't watched the HBO Max documentary, The Vow, enjoy that fucking mind fuck. Because, like, <laughs> wow, 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 wow. He had he took a lot of really good science and a lot of good ancient knowledge and literally perverted it, which, I mean, fucking happens all the time, right? But he was able to make these women believe all of these crazy fucking things. But at the end of the day, those are morbidly unchecked desires and unchecked trauma and self self appointing himself as a genius so that he didn't have to cite his sources and he was just like my channel is the truth you know talk mm -hmm. about an, an over inflated frontal cortex eh. right. like I literally had to sage myself watching that motherfucking shit because it was such a mind fuck and it really sucked because I know that they did help a lot of people like with the program in a way, like the people that weren't hurt because there are people that would come to classes and leave and go off on their own journey. Not everybody that was a part of that 
definitely did, but it was one man, one man at the top of his self-made sexual multi-level marketing pyramid who I 100% from my perspective of watching it, he had unchecked desires. He was infiltrated in whatever format he was. And he spewed this venom on all of these vulnerable, vulnerable women. And it's mm -hmm. like being a woman in general is fucking vulnerable in this world. Oh my God. But to go to a place that tells you that you're safe and you present these weaknesses and these vulnerabilities and then they're used against you and they manipulate mm -hmm. you to keep you in this system or this cycle of false healing right. is what it presented itself to me. It was awful right. to watch. I mean, mm -hmm. I love tattoos, but they're all fucking consensual. You know what I mean? What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Like you branded people with your initials, like fuck off. Like 120 right. years isn't enough for me, but I hope you never see the light of day. Sorry to judge and condemn, but that's fucked up from a human woman perspective. That's fucked up. My heart goes out to anybody that is healing from all of that stuff because it's just like fucking mind blowing. And I don't blame anybody that went through that and like, because nobody like wakes up and they're like, I'm going to go join a cult today. Right. And like, that's a lot of like the <laughs> negative connotation. They're like, oh, reading the newspaper articles, they were like, oh, I would never... I don't even know how you got into that. And I'm like, that documentary does a beautiful presentation of explaining the system, explaining the indoctrination, explaining taking over their finances from literally relying on the company and relying on the curriculum and having to be in his good graces because the women that question his authority or question a fucking thought of anything they were fucking, they were called like a suppressive person. And then they did a bunch of fucking crazy shit to all of these women that I'm like, I cannot believe I'm watching this. Like, I can't believe this guy held this amount of power as long as he did. I can't believe it took the government as long as it did to step in. All wow. I mean, can you, can you not believe it? I mean, I'm trying to be nice here. Like, come on. I'm trying to give somebody... 95% of that, government is compromised. Like, I get really, that. They're, I the, ones, totally they're the ones do. enabling this shit to continue. Yes, there's yes, a yes. Cool his cycle. lawyer was, I just thought, out of his complete fucking mind, too. I was like, this is why there's that joke, like, lawyers are all going to hell. Because I'm like, how can you sit here and have all this information presented to you and go out and be like, this was all consensual, whatever they wanted to do. And I was like... They gave collateral damage to their, their personal life. And when they spoke up about wanting to leave, they were like, okay, well, yeah, you can leave, but you broke your vow. And then we're going to release all this blackmail on you. I was like, that literally cuts the consent like out immediately. If they consented because they wanted to be a part of this higher group and thought it would elevate them. But to the point where these women were like, yeah, he was basically teaching us that, you know, if we slept with him and we were with him, like we would be enlightened through him. And I was like, yeah, it's a fucking cult. Like, that's fucked up. And it didn't start out that way. But he showed a pattern of over 30 plus years of mentally manipulating people and self-proclaiming in this IQ and this genius and all this stuff. Like, he had so much shit that he basically fucked himself over to where multiple people didn't want to work with them. But he's like, well, if I just puppeteer these people in front of me, d d d d d d d d d and then they will go back and be like, oh, well, it's not me. If I hadn't have met this man that I don't even want to say his fucking name, right? If I, like, they validated him to continue to perpetuate his abuse in so many ways. And I know mm. when these women woke up to this, they were like, I brought them into this organization. I feel a responsibility, responsibility to reveal the truth and get them out of this situation. Talk about applause to you. Like Sarah and her husband, I think it was Nippy. Oh, I hate to say it wrong. Her and her husband felt a massive responsibility when they awoke to what was truly going on to get people out. Mark and his wife, Bonnie. Bonnie was the first to leave. All of these people that had to fight against this huge conglomerate, honestly. And then when you find out at the end of the day, it's a big puppeteer show for this one man's unchecked, delusional, high-profit, mm -hmm. indoctrinated like world that he wanted to believe in. And I'm just like, and then, and then there's even that on the spiritual community stage, right? Absolutely. Like, which is why we're definitely bringing Nexium up as a great example of this, because you can find this in small little clusters. You know, even mm -hmm. when I was interviewing a pagan lord for one of my last shows, he talked about how covens stick to like 13 or less, because usually after you get a group that's too big, 
Um, one, it's hard to like maintain, but then they'll break off into little clusters. So, I mean, yeah, like you can keep your group small, but it doesn't mean you're not going to get infiltrated. But man, I mean, you really just have to really build up your own intuition and your own discernment. And yeah, if you have a bad vibe, you don't instantly have to be like, oh, you have a bad vibe, like fuck them. I'm never going around it. But like investigate why you're feeling that way about that person. Like, is it you? Are they showing you something about your shadow side? You don't want to view at the time and then there are there are like every hair on my body stood up and everything about me was like get the fuck out of here and then there were people that they interviewed afterwards that was like oh my god I saw that on the news and I had an opportunity to go and work for them but literally when I went there every part of my body was like no fuck that but in the fucking community he's like yeah there's people that come in and question us and we don't want you like we mm. know, like if you, if, if this doesn't work for you, like, and he would sell them as lesser people, he'd be like, we don't, we don't want you if you're not willing to do the work and you're not willing to do it. But they also fucking sold your intuition as a visceral effect. Like deny your mm. own intuition because your intuition right. is actually just telling you that like you're traumatized and you can't trust this and you can't trust that. Knock their own intuition out of the way. And now I'm the word of you. I have your free will and mm -hmm. I have all mm -hmm. this collateral damage and if you leave and expose what I'm actually doing here, I'm actually going to keep going after you because I have so much fucking money to go after you. And I actually know you don't have shit because you didn't have shit when you came to me and you're not going to have shit when you leave me. Like, that's fucking fucked. And yes, it happened on a big format. And I think that story needs think, to be told. But I think it's like, I think <clears throat> cults aren't anything new. It's just... Usually the cult members don't know they're in a cult. That's why it has a hold over them. They don't even know they're in a cult. Because, because that's they how they're doing so good. Program. They because sold themselves then, as like a self help group, right? But then think about it, like but then think about what we just witnessed in the world. How many people you know went into the the shutdown, cognitive dissonance and programming and they think they're the ones that are in the know and the light and in the truth. But they're actually the ones that are actually the woke ones that are clearly asleep where you're just like, oh, my God, like, how do you not, did you even do your research? Did you even go outside of the, the, norm, the narrative to explore the other part of the argument? Did you even go do your investigation? Or did you blindly accept what was spoon-fed to you as truth and regurgitated it without actually listening to what the fuck you're saying to hear the many hypocrisies that are coming out your mouth that don't make any fucking sense no matter how much you've regurgitated the so-called science it don't fucking make sense logically and they can't argue that yeah, but yet they will they'll try to they'll try to spin circles of their so-called logic and you're like no matter how much you spin this around me you're still not making any sense because it doesn't add up and as soon as you point out the flaw you know then they go into cognitive dissonance and and they start to you know, then they want to cut you out of their life yeah. because you don't agree with them based on their version of logic, right? And you're just like, well, oh, to no, each one, they're I'm scared to be lonely. Yeah, I mean, which we could get in all day of like the loneliness and the comfort zones that people cling to because they're scared to even face that part of their shadow. Like, I have found so much comfort in solitude and being my own best friend, and like, I call it having shy time. Where, yeah, I get a certain amount of time with my daughter during the day, especially with her going out into daycare so she can socialize and learn how to function out in society. Especially, like, you know, having the first two plus years in the house with her, I was like, okay, like, you need to be around other kids. You need to do this. You need to do this. This is good for both of us. I get to go work on my shit, and then we get to come back together. I am really excited for her to go to bed and sleep. And I'm really excited that I get the house to myself for maybe another three hours before my husband comes home. And I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? Are we going to do yoga? Are we going to journal? Are we going to listen to music? Or are we just going to like lay on the ground and stare a bit? Take a bath, meditate. Like, we'll we'll do it all yeah, in like, the bath. You know, like, what am I going to do? Like all the possibilities. And instead of being like, oh, no, I don't want to be alone. Like, let me go distract myself more away from myself. I'm like, oh, God, I have shy time. Oh, hey, girl. Ooh, I'm so <laughs> glad to see you. But, like, I've really cultivated that through my self-love journey and loving to spend time with myself and not feeling like I have to go be around people to really just, like, add value to my life in some way. Like, if you realize 
divinities all around you and like, yeah, you can get into spirit guides and life guides and spirit animals. Like if you just want to sit down and meditate and elevate your frequency and go talk to whoever out there, that's fine. But if you just want to look at the back of your eyelids and breathe and connect with your body, like my shoulder will fucking talk to me and I'm like, okay, move it like this to release that block. And my mm-hmm. hips are tight. Like, why are my hips tight? Why? And like checking in with myself has just been one of the best fucking things ever. And I was able to get that yoga seed planted back in two thir- 2013 and carry it consistently and like pick it up and drop it and pick it up and drop it. And like, the oh, I, have, uh, I have somebody arriving right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally understand. Um, yeah, so, wait, wrapping up. Um, yoga has been the thing that, like, makes me want to sit down and, like, connect. I mean, there's plenty of other things, but, like, if you have issues with being alone, like, you should probably start there because right. all of these growth patterns are going to make you have to go into solitude at some point and really face those things about yourself. So, right. I know you said you have someone there, which is super awesome because literally I said we could talk all day, but before we get off here and present the music, um, one, you've convinced me to come work with you, right? Like I totally, totally want to do toad medicine with you, but you do have a website where able, where people are able to con- contact you, um, holistic vitality. So do you want to list off some of the services before we push people to your website to kind of read through all your descriptions more? I would say either way, just, I mean, I have some services on there, but I would say what most people would go to is just go to service on my website. If you put the website in some sort of link, because it's spelled a little bit differently than what it may sound like, um, you know, it's spelled with a W instead of an H, you know, mm-hmm. from holistic, um, go under services. That's where you can learn about the shamanic journey work. And then there's an intake form that they can fill out and kind of reference what they're interested in. And, and it's like a very detailed deep dive in questions that they can answer so as to kind of so I can understand like where they're at what their background is what they're seeking what their questions are where their traumas are like I really want all that information which no matter what when I meet with them I'm going to want to go deeper anyways that's just going to be able to help me help them navigate where is the best place for them to start whether it's through um that service or exploring, you know, medicinally even so, but that, but medicinally even, I would rather talk to them and see if that's even right for them at at that point as well. So the shamanic journey intake form is going to be very informative for not only myself, but for them as well to, for them to also self-reflect on what is it that they're seeking? What it is that they're needing? What are they aware of? And then the rest is the discovery of what they may find out later. So I would say, um, yeah, to go there. So holisticvitality.com, click on the menu, go to services. You'll find out about the shamanic journey. Um, and then on there, you can fill out an intake form. And that'll be a good way to give me upfront information. I'll learn your availability. We can get something set up and have that exchange. And I'll have a lot more upfront information about you to help them navigate where's the best place to start in, in alignment with where they are and where they're going to get the most out of whatever... Your microphone just went off. Cut off. Can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Okay, hold on. Maybe it needs a second to. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Hello. Yeah, so the intake form for sure. Um, if you're listening on any streaming podcast form or even YouTube, you can just go down to the information description. All of her information will be right there. You can have all of her contact information if you definitely want to work with her. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation and all the other conversations I've had with you. I look forward to many more experiences with you and I just really appreciate you coming on here today and, you know, being vulnerable and expressing all of the idols and anti idols and everything. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like I love tree branches. I love going off on tangents. I love just the expression and human emotion, all of that. So everything that I think both of us said was highly valid and I really hope that it finds the right people and Whoever choose to work with you, choose to work with you. I mean, again, you've completely sold me on toad medicine, even though I was sold on it when I found it in general. But there's a comfortability that you were able to present that I really, really appreciate. Yeah, it's definitely, like I said, I I was afraid, too, to try the unknown. And I was especially afraid with that particular medicine. But I'm very grateful that I was able to 
confront that fear within myself to be willing to surrender into the experience, which I had no choice to do. Cause mm-hmm. when you're trying a new medicine, you have no choice, but to surrender to even try it. Mm-hmm. And even though it taught me the art of letting go of control and surrender, even within my first experience amongst everything else that it made me release, which I didn't even necessarily cover that, but a story for another time for the audience. But I'd be happy to talk to anybody who is curious about it and wants to reach out and wants to ask questions. I'm happy to share, um, share my experiences with it more in detail so they can see if it's right for them. So I'm open to curiosity for the sake of curiosity, irrespective of they decide it's for them or not, you know, um, that's, you know, so yeah, so it is a beautiful medicine. It is, I mean, all of them are, all of them are, mm-hmm. uh, that I one like is that just definitely found your right my favorite because of like how much growth and exponential, healing that is possible in such a short amount of time where it really challenges your idea of time in the first place, thinking like, oh, healing takes lifetime. You know, you think about it, I have lifetimes of shit to heal. I feel like it's going to take this whole lifetime, which sure may be true, but the amount of lifetimes worth of stuff, sometimes I feel like you can accomplish in one sitting is pretty profound when you can experience it like that, you know, um, when you're like, oh, I moved some crazy ass shit today and I feel so much better and lighter and freer than I ever have. And all this stuff is now unfolding for me in these unique ways, synchronistically aligning in my path. And all I did was this one experience that I went into medicine and it opened up a whole can of worms in my life changing. And, you know, I'm grateful that I confronted my fear to try something new that has this kind of effect on my life. You know, that was my experience with it. And so if I can impart that on anybody that's curious or is afraid, mm-hmm. you know, I understand that because we all have to, if you're going to go that route, you have to confront it in order to do it, right? And so uh, obviously now I facilitate it. So obviously I'm still kicking, you know, I'm like still alive. <laughs> and didn't, you know, nothing terrible happened where, you know, where I, to the point where I obviously believe in the medicine and I know offer it so that's just uh I love it there's a lot of strength in your story for sure and we hit again some really good pointers so again I'll have that website link below if you want to hang out with Nicole or her soul name that she now goes by as yes. Akora um, yes but before body, yes before we get <laughs> off here per usual we gotta wrap it up with by vitality's exposed music choice of the day it is going to be unlike Pluto, Yippie Kaye. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to connect again with you. Thank you. This is the Hoosier Media Network. Your home for podcasting.